Thank you, everyone. Chair, we are now live. Thank you, Wendy. Good morning and welcome to East Devon District Council's Virtual Planning Committee on 2nd of December 2020. I'm your chair, Councillor Eileen Rag. I would also like to welcome anyone watching the meeting via the live streaming. All participants here today are taking part remotely, as well as being live streamed. The meeting is being recorded, so please bear this in mind throughout. And may I remind you to be careful with your language. May I also remind members that the Code of Conduct applies throughout the meeting. We also reserve the right to remove and disconnect any participant who is disrupting the meeting by whatever means. <clears throat> As this planning meeting is dependent on internet connection and a power supply in the event of a break in the internet connection or power cut, please bear with us <clears throat> as we try to reconnect. Um, and I lost mine yesterday <laughs> for several hours, so I, I wasn't sure whether I was going to be here today. But um, anyway, we're here. After 15 minutes, if we are not able to reconnect, we will consider the meeting adjourned and reconvene at a later date. Please check the committee page on our website for details. Please make sure all phones are turned off or are on silent <clears throat> and make sure all microphones are muted when you're not speaking to avoid any background noise levels. Keep points short and do not repeat points that have already been made and do not interrupt, a bit like just a minute. If you wish to comment, please raise your electronic blue hand and wait to be called. All councillors have been sent the agenda for today's meeting. Any members of the public who want to view the agenda can do so <clears throat> by visiting our website, www eastdevon.gov.uk. We will now start the meeting by doing a roll call of committee members here present. Can you please now unmute, unmute your microphone? And when you hear your name, please confirm by saying present. When you <coughs> confirm you are present, please mute, mute your microphone again. Um, Sarah, can you read out the list, please? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Rag. Present. <clears throat> Councillor Chamberlain. Present. Councillor Brown. Present. Councillor Davy. Present. Councillor Desarum. Present. Councillor Gazard. Present. Councillor Howe. Present. Councillor Key. Present. Councillor McLaughlin. Present. Present. Thank you. Councillor Pook. Present. Councillor Pratt. Present. Councillor Skinner. Present. Councillor Whibley. Present. Councillor Woodward. Present. Thank you, Chair. The meeting is quorum. Chair, I think you're muted. I am. That makes a change. Um, <clears throat> the running order for today's meeting and the speakers list can be viewed under agenda item one on pages four to five. Right, item two, <clears throat> minutes of the previous meeting, pages six to ten. If anyone has a comment, um, can you please raise your blue hand? If I have no blue hands raised, I'll take it as, as an indication that you all agree the minutes of the previous meeting. Right, I see no blue hands raised. So move on to agenda item three, apologies. Wendy, can you give you the apologies please? Yes, we've received two apologies, a councillor Kim Bloxham and councillor Andrew Coleman. Thank you. Um, item four, declarations of interest. Um, there'll be a roll call for this. Um, Wendy will do that. 
Thank you. So, Councillor Colin Brown, we'll start with you. None. Thank you. Councillor Chamberlain? No declarations of interest. Thank you. Councillor Davey? Um, in common, I assume with other councillors, I have received a letter from the Chair of Bishop's Clist Parish Council about... Um, uh, 21001 MOUT and 21003 LBC. Um, I'm assuming everybody's had that. Um, I've also, in respect of 201855 FUL, um, had a conversation with the concerned resident of Limpston, and I've been forwarded a copy of one of the objectors' submissions to the planning portal. Sorry, that's a bit of a mouthful, but uh, thank you. I'm, should I'm just cover everybody <laughs> else as well. Lovely. Thank you very much. Councillor de Sarum. No uh, XMF items, but I think, as our previous uh, speaker alluded to, I have received the letter from Save, Save Clist St Mary Residents Association, Greg Gre 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 Keely, the chairman. Uh, and I'm, uh, that's in respect of planning application 20 stroke 1001 MOUT and 20 stroke 100 C Wednesday Park. Uh, thank, thank you very much. For, for, thank you. Councillor Gazard. Thank you, Chair. Only to say that I've received the same letters, but uh, no other interests. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Councillor Howe. Right. Um, yes, obviously the same letters. Um, I am a member of Bishop's Cliffs Parish Council for item eight and sticking on item eight, which is Winslade Park. I also own the convenience store and uh, post office in Cliffs St Mary, but I have taken advice from both our legal officers, apart from our legal officer we have today, most surely Shaw, and... Um, oh God, I forgot his name, Henry Gordon Lennox. And both say I have a personal interest. I come with an open mind and I am still open to determination <coughs> on this. So I, it is only a personal interest. Um, I think that's everything. Apart from I've been at meetings with the developer. I've been at meetings with the uh, Save Plus St Mary Residents Associations, both public meetings, um, no private meetings. And I've had private discussions with the developer on two occasions, um, purely on noise issues that were affecting some local residents and the second one on traffic highway issues were also affecting local residents. Um, nothing on the development itself. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Howe. Councillor Key. Yes, uh, because I live out in the sticks, I don't get any letters from people like that, but I must declare an interest on the um, one at Keynes Park Farm, Olliscombe, which is 22082, because I actually know the applicant through the Young Farmers Movement. That's all, only just as a personal meeting. That's all. Thank you, Councillor Key. Councillor McLaughlin. Yeah, um, same, uh, same letters, sorry, no interests. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pook. Uh, no interest except for the receipt of that letter. Thank you. Councillor Pratt. Item 13, then south of Chilcom Cross, uh, Northley. I'm a member of the East Devon AONB partnership. And uh, I refer to the same letter that the other councillors have received. Thank you. Councillor Skinner. Muted. Councillor Skinner. Sorry, I've also received the uh, letters that other members have received around uh, the emails around Winslade Park, uh, the same as everybody else. I'm sure I don't need to go into any more depth. I'm sure it's the same as everybody. Um, and the other one, um, I, as far as Keynes Park is concerned, application 22082 full, um, 
Mr. Summers was a parish councillor when I was the ward member at um, uh, Orlescombe. So uh, just to say that I do know, I do know of the family and I've met them through through over the years through that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Skinner. Councillor Whibley. <clears throat> um, yeah, I too have received the letters and uh, seeing as there's no Exmouth items, that's it. Thank you. Councillor Woodward. Well, I, I feel very disappointed. I'm probably the only one that hasn't received the letter. Um, however, I did have a, I suppose you call it a lobby, indirect oral request um, in respect of the first speaker, uh, Kieran Cayley, uh, last night, but um, that's the only, no other interest at all. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, Councillor Rag. Yeah, well, I'm keeping Councillor Woodward um, company because I haven't had a letter either and I feel very rejected. Um, so uh, <laughs> there you go. If I have had one, I haven't had one through the post and I'm not sure whether it's by email or by post that you've had these notifications, but um, I don't recall having had an email. If I have, then I'll declare it, but it doesn't register with me at all. Thank you. Um, Wendy, you, Wendy. Yes. I, I forgot. I, I'm the ward member for Ulliscombe when the application comes out. Okay. I should, we don't I should actually, have declared that. That's right. We don't actually make a note of ward members. Oh. It's just um, town and parish councillors. But thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, item five, matters of urgency. There are no matters of urgency to discuss. Uh, item six, again, no confidential items. Um, and now item seven, <clears throat> over to Mr. Rose for the appeals statistics on pages 11 to 19, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Morning, everybody. So you'll see this month there's 12 decisions that we've had, quite a few. Uh, five were dismissed uh, and fortunately seven were allowed. If I just run through the seven were, were allowed, uh, one at Road Hill Farm was a certificate of lawfulness where an applicant had applied to say that because they hadn't built the dwelling in the original approved location, it was no longer restricted by the agricultural tie on the building. We fought that appeal, but the inspector agreed with the appellant. So because they hadn't built the original building back a couple of decades ago in the correct place, then it wasn't now subject to that agricultural tie. The second one that was allowed relates to one Victoria Road, which was before committee back in March, I believe, and that was for some replacement windows of one Victoria Road, which is in a conservation area by the Strand in Exmouth. Um, members refused it on the basis of it being in the conservation area and concerns about the UPVC windows, um, but the inspector allowed that appeal. Um, we, there was one in uh, a cottage in Tail Head where we refused one of these prior approval applications on the basis we felt the changes that were proposed were excessive uh, and took it outside of the remit of that process, but the inspector disagreed with us on that. Um, fourth one is Mill Street, uh, where we had concerns about a scheme and an impact on the listed building, but the inspector disagreed uh, and, and said that the impact on the building was acceptable. The sixth one is an infill plot in Honiton, uh, where we delegated a refusal on the basis of it being out of character with the area, but the inspector disagreed. Uh, and the final one uh, was another of these prior approval applications in Wimple, where we were arguing that it went beyond the scope of what they could apply for under that process. But again, the inspector disagreed. So uh, it's a disappointing month in terms of seven allowed and five dismissed, um, but that follows six months where we, we have uh, done very well in terms of uh, having a greater number of appeals dismissed than allowed. So even though we've had this uh, bit of a blip this month, we're still above the national average running at about 70% of applications on the national returns that are dismissed at appeal. So despite this month, our, um, our performance is still good in that regard. Uh, and you can tell from the list I've run through, hopefully that there's no real wider issues there. Uh, each of those appeals was allowed for its own individual reasons. And, and finally, just on appeals, um, uh, members may recall 
uh, that a while ago um, we allowed a gas, oh no, sorry, officers uh, recommended approval of a, a, a gas uh, facility at Liverton. So it was a gen gas generating facility, sort of standby facility. Um, members refused that and it went to appeal and the inspector on quite a finely balanced decision allowed the appeal, but a third party challenged that. Uh, in the High Court. That was heard in the High Court yesterday. Oh. So th about whether um, the High Court would accept the J, uh, the JR into that, uh, into that inspectorate decision. <laughs> um, but I can report that the High Court denied the request from the member of the public for that decision to go forward as part of a JR. So that uh, decision okay. by the inspectorate to uh, allow that appeal okay. uh, still stands. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Um, I see there are two hands up. Councillor Howe? It was actually to pick one up that Mr Rose hasn't spoken about. Obviously, it's not on the agenda. It's uh, Enfield Farm by the Jester that we had the result for last week. Oh, yeah. Uh, wondering if you can give out his thoughts on that, please. Yeah, so it's, it's not on this list because we uh, will go on the list for the next committee, yeah. but that was a, an application where the AD plant in uh, Enfield Farm, we refused permission for it to, well, I was going to say double, but actually it was almost quadruple the throughput uh, of that they could take uh, and therefore the amount of lorries that were associated with that. And I'm pleased to report that the inspector agreed with uh, the council's concerns on that in terms of the impact from increasing that throughput, the impact, detrimental impact that would have on highways uh, in terms of the number of vehicles and the amenity, impact of amenity on the adjoining residents. So it, that was a, it's taken the inspectorate quite a considerable time to determine that application. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was also subject to a, a programme on the local, uh, on the local news. So yeah, pleased to report that that appeal was, uh, was, was dismissed last week. Yeah, thank you. And um, we, we're still dealing with the implications of that. We had a meeting this week about it. Um, it's, a, it's a tricky one. Um, anyway, uh, move on, Councillor Skinner. Um, thank you. I, I just want to pick up on the, the appeal statistics and losing um, eight on, on seven or going being allowed. Uh, where that's sort of coming from. And there's a couple of them are the class Q ones. And I wonder if there's something that we could be looking at in um, whether where we're going with the class Qs and, and the discussion further take place perhaps with officers outside of this meeting. And I think perhaps Madam Chairman might be a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. We, we had that discussion this morning as well um, at delegations. Um, we're concerned about it. Officers and members are concerned about the um, prior uh, permissions. Um, so uh, I think that's going to be a, an ongoing issue, Councillor Skinner, but certainly we are acutely aware, um, but there's very little that we can do about it at this stage. Um, I think it's, it would be down to probably government having a change in direction on that one. Anyway, could, uh, could I just come back on that, Madam yeah. Chairman? Because really, I suppose where I was really going with my question is that is that our interpretation of the class Q as far as the planning authority is concerned of whether or not there's something to have a discussion about that. I'll leave it there because we don't want a big debate about this now, but, but I'll just leave it there as because oh. obviously there's issues and you're obviously talking about it. So that's a good thing. Oh, Thank yes, you. we are. Uh, I don't know. Miss Rose, would you like to make any comments about that? They're, 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 well, personally, they're, they're, they're horrible applications because yeah. obviously the government have bought them in. They give us 56 days in which to make a decision. <laughs> if we don't make a decision, they generally get consent by default and we're very restricted in the things that we can deal with. So it's, it's very hard for members of the public to understand why we have to support some of these applications because at face value, they look, you know, that some of them are clearly contrary to the local plan but we can't take that into account so i think there is a an education element there that we need to do to explain to the public um you know what, what these applications are about um i think from the fact we've lost these appeals although that's disappointing it does show that we are trying to fight them where we think that we can 
uh, mm -hmm. and trying to and and as more go on we'll understand more about where the government go and where the inspectorate want to mm -hmm. allow i suppose my concern is that from the white paper from the government i think the indications are that they're going to go more and more down this route in terms of planning applications um and that's something that officers and members can obviously lobby government about and as members of strategic planning committee have in terms of responses to the to the white paper but it's it it, it is a it, it's a very tricky area and it does result in us having to grant planning permissions for things that we you know are contrary to the local plan and and, and i understand why that causes concerns for for members and the public thank you um right then we move into the applications now um sorry uh, chair Oh, could, sorry, Ollie, I, you've got your hand up. Yeah, it's all right. It was just a quick question to Mr. Rose, just to ask if any costs had been awarded against the council on any of those applications. No, no costs. No. No. Thank you. Right. Agenda item eight. Um, uh, application 21001. Uh, major outline for Winslade Park. And list of building consent 21003. Um, this is Cliff St. Mary, as you know. So uh, I'd like to welcome um, now, forgive me if I pronounce your name wrongly, uh, Garen Cayley, Linda Trim, Carol Spearman, Keith Williams, Andrew Clancy, Councillor Ray Steer Kemp. Well, there's a name from the past. Uh, Mark Edworthy to the meeting and um, uh, I invite, oh, invite Chris to present his report, but remind the speakers, you have three minutes um, to speak. Um, 30, 30 seconds before the three minutes is up, you'll have a reminder. Thank you. Mr. Rose. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'll run through this in quite a bit of detail, so apologies if it, if it takes me a while. Um, so we've got an application at Winslay Park, which is uh, on your screen here. So we've got the got the roundabout at the at the top of the screen here at Cliss St Mary and the road down to Exmouth. So the application relates to a field uh, at this part of the site here. And you can see its relationship to the existing properties, recreation ground here and then down round the main buildings on this part of the site. Uh, and it also includes this parkland to, to the south there. And we've got a hybrid application. So part of that application is for full planning permission for employment uses and leisure uses. And then we have an out, so an, and then part of that hybrid application, the other part is an outline application for the housing and sports elements. And I'll run through those. And then we've also got a listed building application um, because the buildings down here, which I'll show you photos of, Winslade House, Winslade Manor, are grade two star listed. So there's a separate listed building application, mainly for internal works to those buildings to allow them to um, go to office use. Um, so this is the uh, aerial of the site. So we've got the parkland uh, in the foreground here. We've got the main listed buildings here. So you can see the main Winslade Manor and this building here. Uh, we've got leisure facility buildings, as I'll mention here, and then we've got other office buildings on this part of the site. Uh, and then you can see the relationship to uh, the houses in uh, Cliss St. Mary. Um, so the, this is a, I'll run through each of the areas, but um, we've got housing proposed in area one here, sports pitches uh, on area two. Uh, offices in three and four here in the main buildings to be converted, more residential uh, in area six, uh, leisure facilities in area five, uh, offices conversion in eight and seven and eight on there. There's also an extended car park down here uh, and the uh, parkland that I mentioned. Uh, and you can see on the plan here the zones that I'll make, I'll make reference to as we go through. Um, but uh, very, uh, very briefly. Uh, so zone A is at the top of the site here, uh, which has caused uh, understandably concern from uh, a number of local residents. So that zone A um, is for up to 40, uh, uh, sorry, up to 54 dwellings uh, on, a, on a field. 
Uh, I mentioned that at this point because it's relevant to note that their strategy 26B of the local plan relates to Winslay Park. Uh, and if you can see my cursor, that includes the sports elements at the front, uh, wrapping around the site here, wrapping around this building and including uh, this main buildings, these main buildings. So it excludes this field at the front here where they are proposing the housing on. So from that point of view, that element of the scheme is a departure from the local plan. And the local plan policy covering this site uh, is, uh, is seeking development of 150 dwellings and 0.7 hectares of office use. Um, so as these houses are proposed outside of that boundary, it's a departure from the local plan, but I'll come on to the reasons why the applicants are proposing that as we go through. So this is that zone A at the front of the site. So access off the main access into the site, but this, this part of the site is in outline uh, dealing with the means of access off the main access there only. So the number of dwellings, the layout, their heights, relationships to the boundaries of surrounding properties uh, is all something that would be considered as part of a reserve matters application should members grant outline consent on, on that part of the site. Uh, we then move on. Uh, there's a zone B, which is an existing car park area. The application previously proposed additional office units on that part of the site, but given objections from uh, Historic England, and uh, that was removed from the scheme. So that zone B remains as car parking as it is at the moment. Uh, we then got zone B, which is the leisure area. So there's a cricket pitch, new cricket pavilion, football pitches, um, new sports pavilion and refurbished tennis courts. Uh, so that's the, 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 the leisure offer in zone C. Uh, zone D is in the car park to the main house. And this again is in outline for up to 40 dwellings. Um, so that's, uh, that's within the boundary of the, uh, the allocation. We've then got the conversion of Winslade Manor itself and uh, the buildings behind. So their conversion to employment. So basically uh, office use. Uh, zone, this zone uh, F at the rear here is a stables. That's gonna be a leisure complex. So uh, swimming pool, gym, leisure facilities. Um, and then we've got Brook House, which is an existing office building that's proposed to be extended to provide further office accommodation. Uh, whilst on this screen, I'll mention as well the church in the middle of the site here that's outside of the application site, but the site surrounds it. And that is also a, a listed church. We've got Clist House, which uh, is a, a large office block that's there at the moment and proposed to be continue to be in office use, but back into office use. And then we've got Zone J, which is a car park at the moment, but a car park that's proposed to be uh, extended to provide parking for the wider site. And then we have the southern area of the site, which is the community uh, parkland with public access. Um, so just to run through each area in the planning issues, Zone A, as I've mentioned, is a departure from the local plan. So it's outside of the built up area boundary, which runs along the boundary with these residential properties. Um, it's in the countryside and it isn't part of the allocation for the Winslow Park site. So because of that, the housing development on this part of the site uh, is a departure from the local plan. Um, the applicants put this forward for housing uh, because on the basis that um, they aren't, they are retaining much more of the employment floor space within the site than the allocation requires them to do. And as a result of that, and in order to pay for the sports facilities, the leisure facilities and help to pay for the refurbishment of the listed buildings to go into office use, uh, they have brought forward this part of the site for residential. So to offset, um, to, you know, to help pay for those other benefits from the scheme, they're proposing residential on this part of the site. Um, there have been concerns raised from residents uh, about uh, drainage. Uh, part of the delay in getting this application to committee has been quite extensive discussions with Devon County as the lead flood authority to ensure that 
drainage schemes can be designed on this site that ensure that there's no uh, surface water runoff greater than there is at the moment. And that has now been, been dealt with. And with regards to uh, sewers, I know there's concerns from local residents about local capacity, but we've been to Southwest Water on two location, uh, occasions, raising those concerns on an each location, uh, occasion, Southwest Water have uh, come back and said that they have no concerns about the capacity. They aren't asking for any contributions or works or any upgrades. Um, so this is the, I, I need to talk about the relationship of those houses to the, the facilities in Clis St. Mary. So this is the main access into the, the wider site. Um, so you can see a football club in the foreground. So the site's beyond that. And this is the main entrance into the site. And this is the main entrance up into the field for the, the residential dwelling. So residential on this site. Uh, so up the access here, and then you can see the field as it is where those uh, dwellings are proposed. And you can see the boundaries with the existing residents. Uh, some hedge planting, some tree planting, and there, but a number of boundaries that are, that are open and have views across the site. Um, so this is it's this field here that we are talking about uh, for the residential for the residential use, um, and to get from that site to the facilities at Clis St Mary, you'd have to come out of the site and then walk along this road. And as you can see, this road doesn't have any uh, any it's not it doesn't have any footpaths or any lighting, and it eventually leads to uh, the roundabout of Clis uh, Clis St Mary. So. Um, Whilst we think the site is well located close to those facilities, there will there isn't uh, excellent um, footway access. So for that reason, you'll see part of the application is uh, securing a contribution from the developer to put in a better link between the school and the village hall, because uh, there's a footpath desire line there. People drop off children at the village hall to walk them to the school. Uh, applicant, the, the occupiers of this housing scheme make do the same. Um, so we're we're secure or recommending that contribution. In terms of the immunity on those surrounding residents from development on this site, uh, that will be something we'll have to consider at the reserve matter stage. But we're content that subject to uh, suitable design and distances and landscaping, that a suitable scheme can come up that will protect the immunity of those residents. Uh, I did uh, so. I should have said that that uh, this field where these forty, uh, where these fifty-four dwellings are proposed, sorry, is uh, Grade Three agricultural land. Uh, so it would be the loss of uh, fairly high-quality agricultural land, but the land is uh, I can't quite make it out on here. But we've got a football pitch this side. We've got the housing here, and we've got the Winslade Park allocation and the sports pitches to the south. So. Whilst it's grade three, it's quite small in area compared to, um, you know, it's not a significant loss uh, and it's very hard to farm it on its own, given that it's divorced from other, other agricultural fields. So whilst the loss of that agricultural land weighs against the proposal, we aren't proposing to give that or we aren't recommending you give that much weight, given that it's small size and, it, and its context. Um, then zone B, as I mentioned, that's going to retain as car parking. It's car parking at the moment and it's it hidden behind this 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 bund, if you like. So there'll be no changes to to that car park. It is in a flood zone. Uh, it remains to be in that flood zone. So there will be there could be an issue that if that car park starts to flood, then people will no doubt need to be going to their cars and leaving the site to ensure that they don't get don't get damaged. Uh, and if this car park uh, area floods, then the access uh, is likely to be flooding as well. So uh, in light of that, I don't suppose there'll be many movements to the site at, the, at those extreme, uh, extreme weather conditions. Um, and then we move on to the sports pitches. So there, these are proposed to be um, brought back into use. You'll see in the report that there's various conditions that Sport England want to ensure that they're um, that they're brought into suitable use and that there's a, a covered by conditions and agreement that they can be used by the wider community. So this is a, a positive of the application of bringing these back into use, making them available to the public, new sports pavilion, refurbished tennis courts um, and public access to that. So that weighs in favour of the proposal. And these are those, uh, this is the area where those sports pitches have been located and you can see the view back up to the, to the main house. Um, and those sports pitches have been um, unused now for, a, for since the uh, well for a couple of years since the previous occupiers of the site closed closed the site and, and, and stopped that access. And that's you can see the condition of the, the tennis courts there.
So this is the main uh, this is the main Winslay Manor Grade Two listed building, and the building attached at the rear is also listed. So these are proposed to become high highly skilled office jobs, uh, as obviously clearly benefits from from bringing that back into use. And the listed building works are mainly internal to these buildings. Uh, the main manor house, fantastic building. Um, it's got a bit of money in there to, to spend to bring it back up to, to, to a good standard, but it, it will be high quality office accommodation when it's finished. Um, and you can see that there's a few partitions and changes internally, but nothing uh, of any detail that the, the conservation officers have raised any concern about. And obviously there's a benefit of the scheme of bringing that building back into use. And we've got the link to the main uh, building on the right here, which is also listed. It's listed because of its association with the main house and the grounds, um, not to do with any internal features. And they're basically proposing to alter the floor space inside to create uh, office accommodation. So this is an idea of the inside at the moment, not, not a great quality. Um, and they're going to convert it to, to office use. Um, so again, and you can see in the report, the uh, economic development officer's support for the employment and the types of jobs that this is seeking to bring into the site. Um, we then move on to this part of the site, uh, Zone D, which you'll see in the report has also caused concerns for local residents, particularly those that, that live at the back of the site here. You can see that there's uh, tree planting between them and the site, uh, but obviously this time of year, that canopy is a lot, a uh, lot thinner than it's shown on these plans. And we've got an outline application for up to 40 dwellings on this part of the site. So at the back of an existing car park. Um, there's, there's been concerns with this part of the application originally from Historic England about the association and close relationship with uh, the Manor House. And that's resulted in amended plans coming in to show how they could break up blocks on there. And I'll show you an image in a minute how this originally had one large block on it, which caused concerns for Historic England and ourselves. Uh, but they've now shown how they could get uh, three uh, blocks on that site. But again, this part of the site is outlined, so we don't have any details of window positions or designs. Uh, but we are satisfied that you could get uh, a scheme on there that could get up to 40 dwellings uh, on it. Um, so this is from that site, looking back to the main listed buildings. And these are the car park areas where the where that block is proposed and you can see the tree cover. But obviously, as I say, that tree cover is slightly less at, at this time of the year and certainly less than shown in that, that photo. And these are those floor plans that they've shown how they can get uh, two, two and a half, maybe even three storey buildings on that part of the site. Uh, but that will be subject to the reserve matters application. And as I say, these are the old images. We don't have new ones of these, but this is the old image uh, of the block on that part of the site. And it was these images that caused concern to Historic England. And we've now got a scheme that breaks this up into, into three smaller blocks. It was the bulk of that that was causing, causing concern. So you can see the sort of design they might come up with, but, but that would be for further future consideration. We then move on to zone F and the leisure building. So these are previous stables. These are gonna be refurbished. They're gonna be uh, slightly extended uh, and that will provide swimming pool facilities. And you'll see in the report that there, the legal agreement proposes to give access to the school to use those swimming facilities. There's also gym proposed uh, within the building and other associated facilities. And again, the, uh, the proposal is that if there is spare capacity, so once, that, once the pool's used by the school or these leisure facilities are used by any occupiers of the employment buildings and the houses, if there's spare capacity over, then those facilities could be used uh, by the general public as well. They would, they would have access to them. Uh, and you'll see in the report that we're not, uh, we think the benefit uh, that this, this scheme has an acceptable impact on the, on the list of buildings. Uh, this is Brook House, so the existing office building. The proposal here is simply to put two extensions on this office building to provide uh, in increased office space. Again, no harm to the, the character of the area or the surrounding listed buildings. Um, so these are the elevations of those. Uh, this is Clist House. So this is previous office building that's proposed to be retained in office use. And then we come on to zone J for the car parking. So there's some car parking here, but they're proposing to extend it down into the site. Uh, and this is, is within the flood zone. So you can see that there's some concerns uh, from members of the public. So it's to extend the car park down in this area, down the bottom there. Uh, 
Uh, and yet, as I say, you'll see there's concerns from the public about extending the car park into the flood zone. Uh, there's also been concerns about ecology, but you'll see in the report that uh, the applicant submitted a, an ecology report and that there's mitigation proposed and, and increased plant into that part of the site. And finally, uh, we've got the parkland area to the bottom, which is to retain as parkland and uh, going to be made accessible to um, members of the public. Um, in terms of um, just run through some of the issues I haven't mentioned. So um, zone A is contrary to the local plan. It's outside of the allocation. Uh, but as I've, as I've said, um, that that's required, the applicant's cases, that's required in order to provide these benefits, the other benefits of the scheme of the community access, the sports facilities, the access to the swimming pool, the works to the listed building, and because they're providing well in excess of the employment floor space that the allocation proposes. Um, so those benefits need to be weighed against the fact that they're proposing housing outside of the site, but in what we consider to be a fairly sustainable location. Um, they, you'll see from the report that we've been through viability, uh, viability appraisal with the applicant on this site because obviously we don't just take their word for it that they need these houses to be able to afford it. And they've demonstrated to us that that, that, that housing is required to pay for this proposal and that they won't be making uh, any excess uh, profits off of that. And they're proposing 10% affordable housing on that, that housing site to the front. Uh, and the policy requirement would be far greater than that, 50%, uh, but the viability shows because of the cost of the listed building, et cetera, that they can only provide 10% affordable housing. So as I say, there's a balance here between uh, the harm that's caused, if you feel there is harm from the housing on that part of the site that isn't in accordance with the allocation, uh, bits of the car park that go into uh, the flood zone, um, and so we've got to, benefit, uh, got to balance up that, those issues against the benefits from the scheme. And particularly bearing in mind that lots of the schemes, so the, the car park, the sports pitches, the employment uses, the refurbishment of the listed building, the use of the parkland, uh, they're, they're all acceptable in planning policy terms. Um, I've mentioned the concerns about zone D and that block of housing there and how we've, we've amended design of that. Um, I appreciate that there's still concerns from members of the public um, about the close relationship of those of that block to their houses, but there will be uh, probably, uh, well, there will be probably in excess of 20, 25 meters to their dwellings. And obviously as when we get a, a design in, we'll be able to, um, we'll, we'll be able to take, look at the impacts from that carefully. The other issue I haven't really mentioned is highway safety. So you'll see there's significant local concern about the traffic generation that will be coming from this scheme because, <coughs> excuse me, whilst we've got less houses than the 150 allocation, uh, there's a much more employment floor space. So there's concerns about the impact on the highway network, given that the roundabout at Clis St Mary is already uh, uh, congested at times. And you'll see in the report comments from Highways England and DCC as the Highways Authority. Um, the Highways England before part of the, before the office block was removed on this part of the site, they would estimated plus 90 vehicle movements in the morning peak and plus 70 in the evening peak. That will that will have been reduced because of the removal of this office block. Um, but of course, we've got to remember that the baseline here is the consideration of what they can do on this site without planning permission, which is a lot of floor space of employment use. Uh, and the baseline of the local plan allocation, which is 150 houses um, plus some employment on the site. So you'll see in the report that Highways England and, and DCC Highways Authority are happy with uh, the traffic uh, situation. There will be slightly more vehicles on the road, but neither authority feel that uh, that is to an extent that, that's severe enough to justify any sort of any refusal of permission or to raise any concerns. Um, planning obligations, um, I'll, I'll try and wrap this up quickly. So um, there's a footpath to the school that we sought to secure. There's a request from highways for a safety screen to the roundabout, but that's already been provided. You'll see that there's been a request from the rd &E, uh, hospital for uh, contributions towards them. Um, but as you'll see in the report, that hasn't been uh, justified yet. Uh, so we can't secure that. We did, however, uh, very late last week, have a letter from the local NHS in relation to the need 
that local doctor surgeries are at capacity in the area, making a request for uh, well, what what would be thirty nine, just under forty thousand pound now, um, uh, for to go towards those doctor surgeries. The applicant has agreed to that late contribution, um, but we haven't had time to check out the justification for that request uh, in full. So. I'd want to make a change to our recommendation if we can, that if members were to grant permission, that we include the request for this £39,000 towards the local doctor's NHS, uh, but that's subject to officers being satisfied along with the chair and the ward member that they've adequately justified uh, that contribution and they've demonstrated that it's going to go to uh, those local surgeries. Um, we've secured the habitat, habitat impact uh, contributions that we need and Natural England have agreed to that. Um, we've, uh, there's community access to the sports pitches will be in a legal agreement. There's a play area that will be proposed. Maintenance of the open space in the parkland, uh, the provision of the cricket pavilion, the 10% affordable housing. We'd also put an overage clause uh, is recommended on any consent so that if they do make um, any super profit uh, that that um, that that come back to us in the form of an overage. Um, I think the report, there's an error in the report. It does mention something about phasing of the scheme, but there's no phasing. So I apologise for that area, but we would error. We would put a overage on there. And Sport England have re requested a football screen, so that's also to be provided. That's a screen between the pitches and the houses. So there's a there's a housing balance here. Uh, sorry, a balance to be made. A planning balance. You know, we're we're contrary to the local plan. We've got housing in zone A. We've got a lower affordable housing provision than than policy would require. We've got some a car park extending into the flood zone, uh, and we've got those houses on zone A on Grey Three agricultural land. Um, but that needs to be balanced against the significant employment benefits from this scheme. They will be high quality, highly skilled, skilled office jobs. And you can see from the economic development manager's comments uh, that they're saying this is a, you know, not the sort of scheme we get very often in East Devon. There's the refurbishment of the listed buildings that have been done to a high standard. There's the community access to the parkland. There's the sports pitches that are being uh, brought back into use. There's the sports provision. Uh, there's the access to the school for the swimming pool. Uh, and the potentially wider community access to those sports pitches. Uh, uh, and then there's uh, environmental benefits from refurbishing the buildings rather than demolishing what's there and building, building out houses. So um, the officer's view is that those benefits of the scheme outweigh the harm and that housing on zone A. Uh, and in light of the lack of other concerns, it will, we wouldn't be able to justify refusal of the application. So the recommendation is that the hybrid application is approved subject to the adoption of the appropriate assessment, the section 106 legal agreement and the conditions listed. And sorry, but we have also had late comments from environmental health um, wanting to uh, a, a couple of additional uh, comments in relation to the construction of the new dwellings and standard and noise in, impacts from them. So if members were to uh, approve uh, the application, I'd also uh, be grateful if they could add the additional comments that environmental health have recommended. Um, and finally, we're recommending approval of the, the listed building application. Uh, sorry, that took quite a while, but hopefully you can see that the schemes are quite quite involved. Um, but we are we are recommending approval. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Rose, for a very clear and comprehensive report. Um, right, and now we move into the speakers, and we have. The objectors first. Um, Garen Cayley, you have three minutes. Welcome to the meeting. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry if you didn't receive our email that we sent round. I did email all of the um, office or all of the um, councillors involved. Um, I'm a local resident and have set up and run the Safer St Mary campaign. Um, we believe that the developer has basically bought a site and then is trying to manipulate the planning system to get a house and offices on the site and is way outside of the local plan and the local arrangements. If I, as a local resident, was to buy a house with a large garden, would East Devon give me the permission to build a whole pile of houses in the garden because it's a, a, a change from the local plan? The car parks where the developer wants to build houses on, again, 
there's no car parking available at the site. So the car parking is then moved to a flood zone three. How does this work with um, the new electric cars where you plug your cars in? We're going to have grade three, um, a, a flood zone risk three and the electric cars, electrics and water don't mix very well together. We feel the applicant has totally ignored the local plan, the neighbourhood plan, and it's all about their profit and getting the most of um, most things they can possibly get out of the site. And we don't feel it's being the things for the community. There's lots of ifs, buts, maybes, but actually the community isn't getting anything from this. The developer is trying to prove they're getting a 20% profit out of the whole development. This just really doesn't work um, with where we are in Kiss St Mary. And the problems that we've got with the traffic, the flooding, the rivers, the drainage, and the issues that go with the site. It totally undermines the integrity of the local plan that we fought so hard in the village and 200 people locally in a village which hasn't got that many more people have objected this, to this planning application. We ask the officers to refuse this planning application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cayley. Uh, next, we have Linda Trin. Welcome to the meeting. Thank you. you have three minutes. Thank you. Good morning. I am representing Clist St. Mary residents who live in Clist Valley Road, whose homes border Zone D, where proposals for 42 and three storey apartments are submitted, which will overlook residents' properties for six months of the year when the deciduous woodland screening is lost and will be detrimental to the enjoyment of their homes and gardens. The applicants opted to submit only one hybrid application, integrating the regeneration of the redundant offices with inappropriate new build plans. So although the full application elements are supportable, there are over 200 objections to the outline elements in this hybrid. So we must ask the planning committee to refuse this unsuitable application. At the public consultation, only 14 traditional homes were shown in Zone D, but local public trust was lost when the application was submitted and 14 homes were replaced by a three-storey 59 apartment block that after objections was reduced to 40 apartments. However, this village has no local need for housing, having recently delivered around 100 new homes. Although 14 houses in Zone D were supported, but blocks of 40 apartments are not. Your planners acknowledge that this application represents a substantial departure from the local development plan and is contrary to the views of the ward member and the parish council. So we cannot support an approval recommendation. Your conservation officer has stated that the 40 apartment block is totally unacceptable and appears to mimic the modern office development on the site or a student housing block and explains that because Zone D is in the immediate setting in close proximity to the historic manor, it is crucial that an innovative, well-designed scheme is delivered that will not detrimentally impact on the manor and its setting. So approval would result in harm to the self-same asset that you are trying to protect. Zone D proposes excessive quantum, poor design and placement, albeit indicative. The massing and bulk of an apartment block displays a dominating incongruous overbearing design. And even with the visual breaks, it remains intrusive and fails to respect the key characteristics and special qualities of this location in a rural village. It demeans the significance of the historic manor and is contrary to countless policies in the local and neighbourhood plans. Moreover, the government's drive to extend permitted development rights for apartments could see two additional stories added in future without requiring planning permission. This entire remaining. site is being overdeveloped by proposing both increased employment and significant residential uses side by side. This will prove unsustainable and equates to trying to fit two litres into a one litre pot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next we have Carol Spearman. Good morning. Welcome I've to lived the meeting. In... Thank you. Good morning. I've lived in Cliss St Mary <clears throat> for over 20 years and enjoy the privilege of being in East Devon. But we are continually challenged by the ever increasing traffic congestion and flooding generated from the region elsewhere. To add to these conditions from within our own neighbourhood by significant increased mixed uses on this site is misguided, non-sustainable and not supported. 
As a community, we seek enhancement and balance, hence the legal documentation of the neighborhood plan, strategies in the local plan and areas outside uh, built up area boundaries. The equilibrium of this area and the local environment will be greatly compromised by the substantial intensification of mixed uses and public access in addition to all the existing buildings retaining their present commercial use. Please note there is only one single access to the whole of the site from a double junction from Wisley Park Avenue and the main Exmouth Road. This drive is to remain private, to serve all areas, all uses, as well as maintain its security access in the form of a barrier and smart card operation, day and night, which will inevitably compromise public access and create greater congestion. The generation of additional ad hoc vehicular use will not improve the environmental conditions. The local natural topography slopes to river levels, low lying areas flood, current surface water drainage to the leet at the bottom of Winslade Park Avenue results in flooding. The new proposals rely on disposal to these existing locations. All foul drains are connected to the existing main sewer under the floodplain, which backs up in, in surge conditions and adds to flooding in the locality. The proposed development will increase discharge to the existing system which will continue to adversely exacerbate the current flooding pro problem and therefore is not sustainable. The perceived benefit of employment is significantly outweighed by the non-sustainable siting and massing of new residential development. There are no details which provide evidence of compliance with the national planning policy framework for well-designed, visually attractive, good quality enhancements remaining. to the place of, in a rural setting. There is much wisdom in the maxims, less is more, quality, not quantity, and the devil is in the detail. The local planning authority is urged to continue negotiations to achieve a more balanced, open and environmentally acceptable solution which can be supported. This submission should be refused. Thank you. Thank you. Right, Keith Williams, welcome to the meeting. You have three minutes. Um, sorry, I'm, I hope I'm unmuted. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Hi. Good morning. Um, I'm speaking about Zone A, the agricultural green field. The majority of the proposed field is Grade 3A agricultural land. That's best and most versatile. The application proposes to build 54 dwellings on the field. When the field came up for sale around 2011, village residents attempted to buy it for use as a community green space, but were outbid as the field became subject to speculative interest and was eventually sold for far more than its market value as agricultural land. Now it seems the land speculation continues. It's potentially lucrative for the owners, but at the expense of our village community. It was specifically removed by East Devon District Council from the local plan. It's outside the built up area boundary. It was excluded from the neighborhood plan and allocated as local green space. So the proposal for zone A rides roughshod over local democracy and the wishes of the community. I may be an old cynic, but I'm hoping you will show me that local democracy and the protection of our green spaces still count for something. You may think that every community has to play its part in meeting the housing demand that the government say we have to meet, but our village has already seen 100 new homes delivered in the last three years, far more than our share. Notwithstanding these 100 new homes, the village is supportive of development of the existing brownfield site, particularly the restoration of employment in the office buildings and the sports and leisure facilities. This should not be at the expense of surrendering greenfield land to be concreted over. The applicants say they cannot deliver the brownfield development without the profit from the greenfield development, but they would say that, wouldn't they? They've already started refurbishment of the manor house and let 75% of the office space. That seems risky. If it's not profitable without planning permission to build houses in Zone A, what will they do if they don't get that permission? Abandon the refurbishment? Cancel the tenancy agreements for the offices? The site had its own designated plan, Section 26B of the local plan. This was specifically to allow re redevelopment of the site based on 100% brownfield development. Burrington Estates knew this when they purchased the site. Since the application is only for outline consent, there is no guarantee the number of houses would not be further increased 
and the design also altered to increase the number of stories by a subsequent application for full planning permission. As Zone A lies outside the site allocated by Strategy 26B and also outside the BUAB, any proposed development there must be assessed against the policy requirements of Strategy 7. The strategy states explicitly the development will only be permitted remaining. in the countryside where it is accord in accordance with a specific local or neighbourhood plan policy and where it would not harm landscape amenity or environmental qualities of the area. However, there is no policy support for the scheme in either the East Devon local plan or the neighbourhood plan and the proposed development will also likely cause harm to the landscape amenity and environment of the area. The pros, proposed development clearly conflicts with the policy requirements of Strategy 7 of the East Devon Local Plan. I walked down to the field yesterday and looked over the fence. I'm sorry. This is a lovely little piece of Devon countryside. It could provide a valuable open space for residents to enjoy, as we hoped when we tried to buy the land a few years ago. Somewhere to have a picnic, fly a kite, let the kids run around. Or it could be left Thank in its you, natural Ms. state. Williams, you've had more than your three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tanya Smith, welcome to the meeting. Would you like to make your representation, please? Chair, I've got a statement to be read out um, on their behalf. All right, a statement, okay. Statement from the governing body of the Three Rivers Federation in support of the proposed development of Winslade Park. Thank you. The governing board of the Three Rivers Federation, comprising Cliss St Mary Primary School and Stoke Cannon CEVC Primary School, is keen to secure ongoing access to enhanced local sports facilities. In particular, governors welcome priority access to affordable swimming facilities, as identified on page 88 of the committee report, which will help address current problems of access to high quality local swimming pool provision. For many years, access to Winslade Park has played an important part in helping Cliff St. Mary children to develop competence in a broad range of physical activities and governors support plans that enable safe pedestrian access to these pitches, as well as providing safe walking routes between the old and new villages for the purposes of accessing new and reinstated sports pitches, leisure facilities, and parkland proposed as part of the development. Beyond the terms of the Section 106 agreement, governors are keen to engage with East Devon District Council, Bishop's Clist Parish Council, and all interested parties to understand the range of both immediate and longer term measures to improve pedestrian access, road safety, and signage, which may be achieved with the use of SIL funds. This will signal a strong and joint local commitment to promoting healthy and active lifestyles and ensure that opportunities for children to become physically confident are robust and sustainable for future and current generations. With thanks, the Governing Board. Thank you, Sarah. Um, next, we have Andrew Clancy. Uh, hi, good morning. Uh, my name's morning. Andrew. Yeah, good morning. Uh, my name's Andrew and I'm the founder uh, of Chorus, a local SME. Uh, the name Chorus is all about community, bringing together our staff, our families and our clients to share in a common goal. Um, I'm speaking to you today in support of this once in a generation opportunity to create something exceptional for the community. I'd like to highlight three key points. The importance of Winslade for Chorus, my staff and for business sustainability. So in terms of point one, the importance of Winslade for Chorus. I started the business 18 months ago and have far exceeded mine and my family's expectations in terms of what was achievable. Even a global pandemic has not held us back. We have grown from one person sat in a small dank office to 16 full-time members of staff. Since the start of the pandemic, we've employed eight people, four of which were previously unemployed. Our projections show us doubling in size within 12 months and Winslade is critical to my business and plans to attract and retain the most exceptional staff. If this application is not approved today, I will have to seek alternative premises, put into je to jeopardy current jobs and delay any future expansion. This leads me on to the importance of Winslade for my staff. The he health and wellbeing aspects of Winslade Park are there for all to see. The fantastic grounds, the woodland walk, the sports pitches, the meandering brook and the world-class facilities that will be installed if this application is granted. We've introduced a new staff benefit to provide lunchtime PT sessions for our staff and the uptake has been outstanding. Providing facilities like this will allow businesses like mine 
to attract and retain the best staff right here in East Devon. Please do not miss this opportunity for East Devon and Exeter to become exceptional at recruiting world-class talent to the region. My final point is around the sustainability of businesses at Winslade. We recently undertook a staff survey that revealed 40% of our team will be able to cycle to work when we move to Winslade, opposed to the city centre. Cycling into the centre for some was too far from their homes and gave them anxiety of cycling through a congested city centre. Having a fit and healthy workforce means they'll perform better and be happier in their lives, something this pandemic has highlighted as being all too important. So in summary, this application provides a lifeline for many businesses for future prosperity, which hinges around the wider regeneration of Winslow Park. This once in a lifetime opportunity is crucial for my business to grow, staff to work in a diverse workplace that puts well-being at the forefront and sustainability into business growth in East Devon. The word business means much more than just about making money, social purpose, sustainability and responsibility. 30 all, seconds remaining. We all have an ethical responsibility today to consider the economic consequences of not granting this application for all the businesses that use Winslow Park. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Clancy. And next we have another supporter, Matt Phillips. Um, I think he sent in a statement. Wendy, can you read that one out, please? Yes, thank you. So um, he begins, thank you, Chair. Good morning, councillors. I am Matt Phillips, Managing Director of IT Champion, founded in 2009 and now employing 23 people in the Greater Exeter area. Our business goal is to deliver a hassle-free, unlimited usage and low-cost IT solution for SME and enterprise clients. It's refreshing to see the development of office spaces that delivers so much flexibility in relation to size, lease term and range of technology connectivity solutions on offer. As Exeter's leading IT solutions company, we are genuinely excited at the prospect of working with a range of local businesses as they transition to what will become the leading business campus in the Southwest. We ourselves actively consider taking space at Winslow Park. There's a natural fit between a growing IT company and a super connected development, a development that offers the same hassle-free approach on which we predict our services to business. The news that Burrington Estates have teamed up with Jurassic Fiber to provide a 10 gigabytes line into the park delivering incredible connectivity makes the offering that will be delivered at Winslow Park even more exciting. Connectivity across much of the East Devon and Greater Exeter area is at present patchy and through their partnership working. Burriton Estates are setting a new standard within the locale. This would be a really important step forward for the competitiveness of East Devon. Business Business growth and the provision of high paid skilled jobs depend on the best possible connectivity. Burriton Estates vision for the Winslow Park will not only bring back in, into use an empty unused site that would otherwise be wasted to the community, but will also provide a huge shot in the arm for the East Devon and Greater Exeter economy. I would urge support for this planning application in the strongest possible terms. Thank you, Wendy. Um, another supporter now, Michael Hesketh, another statement to be read out, I think by you, Wendy, or Sarah? It's me, Chair. Thank yeah, you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Good morning, members of Planning Committee. My name is Mike Hesketh, owner of Hesketh Healthcare Limited. We are a fast growing business providing high quality service to premises for medical professionals with plans to employ over 100 local people. We have been looking for expansion opportunities within East Devon for quite some time. However, options of the right quality levels are few and far between. We were drawn to Winslade Park, being impressed with Burrington's objectives in creating a business park focused on well-being. This has a strong synergy with our company. The proximity to the M5 is important in establishing a connected community. 
the Burrington Estates vision combining life, work and well-being space focused on health on the outskirts of a university city that is built on a knowledge-based economy is unique to East Devon and perhaps the Southwest. This is often talked about on other developments, but not ever actually delivered, bringing a long-term vacant brownfield site back into use and creating high quality jobs will make a significant contribution to the East Devon economy. As a small business, we feel the council should support this innovation and provide opportunities for local people. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sarah. Um, now we go to the applicant, Mr. Mark Edworthy. Um, he's speaking on behalf of the applicant, I believe. Would you like Thank to you. begin? Welcome to the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, councillors. I, I am Mark Edworthy of Burrington Estates. We are hugely proud to directly employ 85 local people and indirectly 800 local people. Our company's mission is to create beautiful living and working environments, build enduring communities and to improve quality of lives. We genuinely walk the talk on this. A few examples. Dean Clark House in the centre of Exeter was an abandoned derelict hospital. This is now a vibrant, enduring community accommodating 54 apartments, 12 businesses, and the popular Cozy Club restaurant. The ship in Plymouth is the iconic glass building which was under threat of being demolished. Through careful regeneration, over 800 new jobs were created in this wonderful building. On housing, we have completed 12 stunning housing developments across the region, including neighbouring Cliff St George and Topsham. We have received numerous national quality awards in the process, including a five-star customer service recognition. We pride ourselves on our differentiation from the bigger developers, PLC builders, through quality, style, design, and customer service. We will bring this same approach to the Wednesday Park development to provide beautiful homes for many more Cliss St. Mary families, new and old. Our overriding principle with the design was to ensure that we brought back the buildings back into commercial use to create a vibrant new business hub for East Devon. Our scheme preserves the stunning manor house and other valuable architecture, creates business space for approximately 2000 jobs, ensures the 94 dwellings are low density. Further, we have offered around 2 million of social housing value despite the viability showing we could have offered zero bringing 80 acres back into the Cliss St. Mary community, providing a new centre for family and individual well-being. The Leisure Club is to be refurbished to exceptional standards. There will be tennis courts, dog walking, running tracks, yoga, pilates, etc. Also cricket and football pitches for local use. Picnics and kite flying will be welcomed. We have done this to create a destination at Winstead Park that our region can be proud of generating over 100 million of economic activity and supporting the local community. Our team have worked exceptionally hard with your planners to come to this meeting with a recommendation of approval. On 30 a seconds remaining. This planning application is fair to all. We have support in writing from Cliss St. Mary Primary School, a large number of local residents and a significant number of local businesses. The Council's economic development team have stated we are presented one of the most significant prospects for improved employment opportunity and local economic benefit that our district has seen in recent years. From an economic development perspective, the scale diverse range and overall quality of the employment offer within this proposed development warrants the strongest possible support. We believe this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to develop Windsor Park correctly. Please councillors, let us fulfill this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And lastly, no, not last, we have Councillor Ray Steer-Kemp. Welcome to the, to the meeting, Mr. Councillor Kemp. And he's speaking on behalf of Bishop Cliss Parish Council. Um, don't know, for those of you who might not be aware, Mr. Steer-Kemp used to be a Planning Enforcement Officer for East Devon District Council. So good to see you again, Ray. You're muted. You're muted. Oh, 
I'll see if I can unmute him a moment. All right. Oh, Thank you. There we go. Are we there now? Yes, you're my, there now. My apologies. Members of the Planning Committee, thank you on behalf of Bishop's Cliff Parish Council for this opportunity to address you on this most important application by Burrington Estates. The very nature of this hybrid application has posed difficulties for the Parish Council as the matters in outline give no details of exactly what is to come. Despite the many benefits of this scheme, the Parish Council continues to object to the application and have four major concerns. Firstly, Zone A and the provision of 54 dwellings. Development in this area is contrary to local and neighbourhood plans and outside the built-up area boundary. In recent discussions with the applicants, they offered to enter into a unilateral undertaking to ensure that only chalet bungalows were built on the perimeter of this site to limit the impact on adjacent existing properties, but this has not been forthcoming. Should a permission be granted, we think it is vital that this issue is addressed, as we are not confident that reserved matters will provide the necessary protection for local residents. We also have concerns about the sewerage system. Our second concern is the proposal for the three apartment blocks in Zone D in close proximity to the church and the Grade 2 listed manor house. We consider the present proposed two and three storey blocks are inappropriate, are too high and would constitute a major visual intrusion. They would also have an adverse impact on the amenity of residents in Cliss Valley Road from overlooking and loss of privacy. Our third concern is the provision in perpetuity of public access to Zone C and K and sports facilities in Zone C. We see that a legal agreement is proposed in connection with the use of the sports facilities in Zone C, which will be offered free of charge for use by Clissett Mary Primary School. We require assurances that similar access to the sports facilities is provided to the community at a zero or reasonable cost. Lastly, we have serious concerns about the impact that a considerable number remaining. of business users and residents' vehicles will have on the local road network. There is no doubt in our mind, and we live with the problem on a daily basis, that the gridlock that already exists at various times will be made that much worse and traffic in the vicinity will be brought to a standstill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Steerkamp. Um, now, I invite the ward member, Councillor Mike Howe. Mike, you have five minutes, or no, you don't. You have as long as you want. I'm sure you won't. You'll make it um, very clear. I'll try Thank to you. keep it under an hour, then, Chair. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, where do I start with this? I suppose I'll do it in reverse order. I need to start with the positives, because this development does bring positives with it. The reuse of listed buildings, bringing bracket back into practical and sustainable use. They've been not used for 10 years plus. Mm. They are vital listed buildings um, that we as a council need to protect. It brings jobs or brings back jobs to the local economy that we lost 10 to 15 years ago. Mm. Um, it brings back the sports provision that we lost 10 to 15 years ago, although we could argue that we never really had it much because um, one of the last owners refused us access to it. Whereas originally London and Manchester, the first builder of the site allowed the local residents access. Um, so there are positives. It, it does an awful lot for the ecology, although at the same time, it will harm some uh, species around kingfishers in the river, deer that are now seen wandering quite freely around the area, etc. So it's balance, and it's how we balance that against the downside. The first one of the downsides is obviously traffic, and that's where we have to be really clear. This site could be back in operation tomorrow, as far as anyone does, without planning permission being granted. It used to use, well, numbers are sketchy, 
roughly two and a half thousand people employed. Um, some have said up to three and a half thousand. Some have said as low as a thousand. I'll stick in the middle at two and a half thousand. A lot of our residents won't remember the chaos that was caused when the site was last operating. It had a bus route that came down Church Lane that uh, allowed people to frequently get on and off the bus directly outside the church. That isn't part of these proposals, of course, because it's not one company operating the site anymore. It is several small companies inside. Um, that limited some of the car use, but certainly didn't stop the car use and the queues of traffic trying to get out onto the 376 and then into Exeter and everything else that will reoccur. But that is now. That can happen anyway today. So what have we got? We've got a expanded um, employment space by two extra added blocks onto one of the buildings. Um, we've got more car parking space. We've lost through the application one building, thank goodness. And we've got housing. And that's where I come to next, housing. Zone A is a greenfield. It is a greenfield both local residents and the parish council have looked at buying in the past. They failed. It is not really part of any farm. It hasn't been farmed for donkey's years either. It is good agricultural land, um, although that is disputed at times as well. Um, but it is cut off from any farm. So what can we do with it? Um, and my biggest criticism, Zone D, I really hate this tower blocks that are being proposed. I know in outline, so we haven't got any design characteristics or anything else, but um, the dense woodland that is currently shown along the site um, is all deciduous. And it's lovely during spring, summer, and the beginning of autumn. Come to winter though, it is completely bare and completely stark to see through. Um, so I have real concerns, particularly about the three story. So if, the, if, the, if this committee decides to approve, I really would like us to bench out um, along with uh, Historic England and our conservation officers um, that it should be no more than two stories and really should be limited in its number um, further than it currently is. Affordable housing. Now, they've offered 10% and it is a great offer because viability clearly shows they don't have to offer anything. But once again, Cliff St. Mary actually has already provided far in excess of the amount required in the local area. Um, along with the second development the Barringtons have talked about with Cliff St. George, um, that had affordable in it as well. Um, we have gone far and beyond the local requirement. Now we know there is a more national, a more regional requirement, but if it's about housing numbers and it allows us to take that third story off the apartment block, I would rather we went with zero affordable housing and recoup some of that back into the development itself um, in lessening some of that infrastructure need. I've got to come back to transport. Um, and Mr. Rose, could you put your screen back up and show that footpath that you, or the lack of footpath along the bottom of Winslade Park Avenue and that junction, um, if you could, please? Oh, that one. Got some nice photos there somewhere of it. We'll get there in a minute. Mm. Got loads of them. I need to make it clear, that's all. Right, that, that stop there, that's perfect. Um, now, as you can see, that's not a bad little road. It's um, just about wide enough for two cars if you're lucky. And at this minute in time, when this photo was taken, it's perfectly empty. Um, a year ago, when we weren't in this COVID situation, and who knows what next year's going to bring, but let's be positive we're going to get back to some normality. This road in the morning and evening is absolutely chock-a-block both ways with rat runners. Um, it is lethal. 
Monday to Friday, in the morning and the evening. And that is why we've asked for Section 106 money to allow people to drive out of this development and drive to the village. Um, highways can't put a footpath there, even though I think there's enough room to move the road slightly to the left and then put a footpath along the houses. But they say we can't. But it is dangerous. And walking along there, particularly late at night with no street lights and all the rest of it, although you can see one street light right in front of us, the rest of the run hasn't got it is dangerous. Now, the other point, Mr. Rose, can you show the junction just, I think it's the one before. No, one after then it must have been. I think it is before. That there, that junction there. And this is the other highway concern. Now, accepting it is an existing access, already we have had several near misses on this junction where cars turn in from the camera position and then instantly cut across the traf any cars coming from Winslade Park Avenue, which is coming along to your left, and turn into Winslade Park, which is almost where the BT vans are parked. They sweep across that corner with no acknowledgement that they actually they have to sit and wait. We are expecting, let's be reasonable, 1,000 plus cars in the morning rush hour turning, making this junction. It's not a safe junction. And highways, in capacity terms, I get, they can't really ob object to much, but in safety terms, okay. they are letting us down. And that is ignoring the roundabout, which is going to be absolutely chock-a-block from start to finish right behind us. Um, Southwest water. Um, I feel I've been the bane of Southwest water's life all my life. Um, and I expect I join the chair in that and sometimes. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Southwest Water's general acceptance of this, um, I really struggle with. They have known issues in the area. They know that surface water joins the sewer and then the sewer bottoms out or tops out, whatever it is, and floods into the local areas. The brook the, that's just to your left on this photo and in the bottom of the village. They want to solve that problem. They've been trying to solve that problem for five years plus. They still don't have a plan how they're going to. Yet they're allowing more housing to go into a already congested sewer that causes issues with no requirement for infrastructure or anything else. Now, I suppose they can't ask for infrastructure when they don't know what they're going to do. That's the issue. But once again, Southwest Water is making a mockery of what should be happening and leaving it to the local community when or if this development goes ahead to pick up the phone and then again argue with South Coast Water about what they should be doing to stop polluting the local rivers, uh, sewage overflowing on people's uh, driveways and other places. It's just not acceptable, but one reason or another, we've got to do it. Um, the last question I have is about car parking in Car Park J. Now that has been expended, extended massively in this application across a flood zone um, in a very wildlife intensive area. And actually, if you go into that area along the footpath, which runs through this site, um, it is really quite disappointing um, that this expansion is being allowed, especially as originally there was an extra office block that was being proposed that is now being taken out and the car parking that was lost in that other car park, in another flood zone, by the way, in zone uh, D, um, is now being repurposed and put back in. So we've got a surplus of car parking as well. Um, so there is a question about that, as to how that's going to work and why we need so much extra car parking when zone J in particular runs alongside the Grindle Brook, which quite happily... Uh, supports the kingfishers and other animals, slow worms in the area and all the rest of it that needs some consideration. We do need to look after our wildlife. Although the vast areas of having the sports provision back, the open plan to actually use the fields are lovely and really appreciated. So don't get me wrong, Burrington, I'm not having a total go at you, but the fundamental comes down to, can we accept zone D in its current form which is what is causing the most aggro and I have the most sympathy for, uh, the apartment block in zone D, 
and zone A. Um, is there any way we can make zone A slightly better? The rest, I guess, I'm going to have to leave up to you guys to come and discuss and see how the discussion goes. If someone does want to propose approval, though, I do have some recommendations on conditions that I would like to put if approval is put on the table. Um, but for now, I'd like to see how you all think, and I'm happy to answer any questions during this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Howe. Um, I have a couple of questions just for clarity. We've had some very cogent arguments, both in support uh, and objecting to this application. Um, in summary, uh, although it's a, a departure from the local plan, it's considered that the benefits outweigh um, those considerations. What I'd like to ask is, um, it would have been helpful, I think, had the applicant um, consulted with Devon County Highways um, at the pre-application stage. Um, it's disappointing that they didn't do that. Um, Devon County Highways says, um, this does not change the view, that's the amendments, um, re relating to the size of vehicles and types. Uh, attracted to the site, does not change the view of the County Highways Authority and the mitigating measures above in the form of contributions and more clarity access arrangements is still requested. And they actually ask that conditions um, be made it, on any grant of the applic uh, planning application. Now, I don't see that unless I'm missing something in the list of conditions at the end of the report. Um, I wonder if Mr. Rose could enlighten us on that, please. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, so we have, we've obviously been in discussion with uh, County Highways and taken on board their comments and been liaising with them closely. And uh, yeah, we've got the, the, the conditions that are being proposed uh, and the, the, the legal agreement uh, is, is in accordance with, um, well, the, the conditions are in accordance with what um, the County Highway Authority want. That, thank you very much. That's, that's clarifying things for me. Um, right, now we have Councillor Skinner. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't relish uh, Councillor Howe's position on this. He's in a very difficult position. Um, when you look at this application, wow, it's a big application. And we've been an hour and a half and we've only just got this far and we haven't started the discussion yet. But I think this sort of application needs a lot of time and it does need time because it's really, really important. I think there are many benefits that come with this application as been outlined by Burlington Estates in the way they've gone forward. This application in the past of my time in position on the council, that this, this site has changed from different owners and different owners have found it very difficult to wade through the treacle to come up with something that is going to work both for the community and also in making obviously a profit to make it stand up and to make it work. There's nothing wrong in that. That's absolutely right. And that's where uh, developers need to come forward in investing because it's called investment and they need to make money out of it. What we need to get is the balance between the community. And I absolutely appreciate from where the community is coming. And nobody has to tell me about how about the Cliff St. Mary Road. Anybody who lives in Exmouth would know Cliff St. Mary in the mornings. You catch the traffic wrong, either going in or coming out. And even though it's even extended over longer times than it's a junction that absolutely needs sorting out. We could have a discussion about how that should be done uh, another day. But as far as this application is going on, I, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to listen to those people that are very close to this. It's all very well the likes of myself reading reports like we have. And I read this from with great, great um, um, uh, uh, clarity in trying to understand all the bits and pieces, but you need, need to almost live it and breathe it like Councillor Howe has had to live and breathe this for many years now. And I take on board all the things he has. And I'm really pleased that he's actually said that if it does come forward with uh, a, a recommendation for approval, and I'm, I'm mindful to just hold on to that for the minute 
um, but he has some conditions that he thinks that he would like to, to add to that. Because it seems to me that the old house and the church, and I remember the church and, and all that, there is lots of grade two and grade two listed um, um, artif artifacts of buildings that need, and a bridge, I believe, that need to be looked after and it needs to be absolutely managed well. I think what Boeington Estates have done with this application is try to manage it to the best of their ability in coming out and obviously work tirelessly uh, over a long period of time to get into this place. It appears by listening to both the public and by listening to um, the people uh, who support this application and even the people that have moved into this site, that there are pros and cons for it. And it's almost like, and I'm sure Councillor Howe would love to be able to say, listen, with this application, what if we could just cherry pick all the good bits a minute, let's just deal with them, and then let's try to negotiate through some of the bits that are a little bit harder to both pacify both the, the members of, of the public who live around there to ensure where, where, where they live and the environment in which they're going to live, and also uh, to make sure that Boeington Estates also come out of this looking on the right side. So it's a real difficult uh, way of going forward in the way this has been. But the, to my mind of thinking, uh, Madam Chairman, I, I, I think I'm going to be mindful to move a recommendation of approval uh, at this moment in time to see if there is a seconder. I very much listened to the debate but my recommendation of approval, if I may come back in the course of time, I'm going to be very minded what Councillor Howe has to say in his, what he might call his recommendations or what he might lead to or conditions he might like to add to that, because I think they're going to be very coherent in trying to get ourselves into a good place. This has been going on for a long time. These buildings need to be used. The land needs to be used. And I don't think it's the perfect application, but we need to be making some moves forward. And I'm sure Councillor Howe has some things to add to that. I'm going to leave it to that, Madam Chairman, by moving the recommendation of approval. Thank you. Is there a second? Yes, that? Madam Chairman. I'm quite happy to second that application. Thank you, Councillor Key. Yes. Can I speak now? Uh, yes, you're next on the list. Right, thank you very much. Um, now, I can speak with a little bit of experience on this because in actual fact, I have found out one or two um, things about it. My daughter worked there from 1987 until 1994. And when she was there, there was 2,100 people working there, right? So, uh, Mr. Uh, Councillor Howe wasn't very far out. What I would like to say is um, two or three people have actually said about the grade of this land and grade three is not top quality. OK, it'll grow grass and it'll grow corn, but it's not any better or any good for growing anything beyond that of any significance. So it's not top quality ground. And it's like... Um, uh, was previously said it's a long way from any farm and wouldn't be accessible for there. Um, now, I mean, when my daughter was there, she said the actual access was abominable uh, going in and coming out because there was no protection there. But I mean, that has been improved. I do agree with Councillor Howe what he said with regard to that three-storey building there. I do feel that that is, what can one say, an eyesore, because I think it's completely wrong to have three stories there right um, so close uh, to the um, existing house. Um, I'm more than happy to, uh, for uh, Councillor Howe to actually put forward any um, uh, recommendations that could go with it with regard to that or anything else, but I'm more than happy to second the uh, approval of the application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Key. Um, Councillor Woodward. Councillor Woodward. Yes, thank you, Chair. So I was just finding my unmute button. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, declare um, a nostalgic interest in Winslade Park. Um, 
I was an employee on the site uh, from 1984 to 1999. I regret I don't know Councillor Key's daughter, but um, there we are. Because there were so many employees, it's probably not unlikely. Um, and I worked in both Brook House and uh, Clist House and had daily visits to the Manor House and uh, Winslade House as well. And a frequent visitor to the stable club with its swimming pool and gym, as it was then. Um, so I was really pleased to see that actually substantial amendments have been made since the original application. And I was a bit perturbed by the buildings that would have been on zone B, but they're not there now. So we have a car park as it was, as I knew it. Um, so I'm very pleased to see that. Uh, that change. Um, but we've got applications for refurbishment and I think that's it's long overdue and I'm very pleased to see the offices being refurbished and the housing matters are going to be outlined so I think concerns about them uh, will be seen in the detail as opposed to saying they, they shouldn't go ahead now. Um, and reading the report is very long and there were issues raised and I do believe they've been dealt with by the conditions, the numerous 21 plus 10 conditions which have been set out. There was a concern or there is a concern I, I guess about the affordable housing and it should be more housing than affordable housing than that but I can see that it's a trade-off between the development of the heritage sites, the listed buildings and the expense in that and the need to recover and as I understand it from uh, Mr. Rose, the viability arrangements have been looked at and they found to be acceptable. I think the economic development officer made a very good point and he said that the economic benefits should not be underestimated. And I think that's right, particularly now with the way the economy is going for the country as a whole, if we can re-establish um, good grade employment here in this site, I think that'd be most welcome for everybody. Um, transport is an issue and I thoroughly appreciate that. There was a long line of cars between four and six going down the slope down to well before when I was originally, there was no, there were no lights at all. Um, and that is a concern and I think, but I understand there's going to be a transport plan provided as part of the conditions. So I think that is an issue, but doesn't prevent um, considering approval overall. Um, and on the traffic matter, uh, if you think there were two and a half employees, a thousand cars, over a thousand car parking spaces. And my understanding is that certainly it's 20 years ago since I was there, but that's been hardly any traffic over the last few years. So it's actually been putting traffic back to as it was in the nineties. So I don't think that should be an objection either. Um, in the Bishop's Clist comments, they made uh, reference to the use classes order and why they were so varied. But in back in the 90s, we had uh, a hairdressers, we had a convenience store, although it's quite small, and also the gym and the swimming pool. So again, that is putting things back as they were before. On flooding, it may be in a flood zone, both zones J and B, but in my experience, I used to park my car um, between Clist House and in, within what is now zone J, and I'd never experienced any flooding personally. So that was over a 15 year period. So although climate change may things make, make things worse in the future, um, it was not my experience that that was an issue. Um, and there is a need for so many car parking spaces. There was um, some concern even back in the 90s and the 80s with the residents of Winslade Park. Um, and we was very clear, made clear to all employees that they should not be parking on the residents, residential areas. And that's why there are so many car parking spaces. So as not to um, clog up or interfere with the residents that are in Winslade Park itself. Um, so Mr. Cayley mentioned the car parks and he says that um, concerned about the electric vehicles, but as I say, I, that was not my experience. Uh, he mentions that the community doesn't get anything from this. Well, that, I think that's um, 
one could look at it another way by seeing that there's parkland, there's going to be facilities for the school, there's sports pitches, there'll be local employment, mm. um, there'll be em employees going to the post office, going to the shop, which I often used to do. So I think there is a great deal that the community can get from this. Um, on Zone D and the flats, as they will probably be, uh, the 40 um, houses or apartments, they will come under the outline permission. So we don't know what the detail will be, as is there in the summer now, there is considerable shielding by the, the trees. And with regard to the relationship to the manor house, the manor house, its main focus is out over the cricket pitch. Um, and it already is attached to another building. So it depends on the quality of the building, whether there's an impact upon the manor house and whether that's going to be harmful. But I, we'll have to wait and see how that is in the, in the outline. Um, I think Mr. Williams was very persuasive in his, and spoke very eloquently about the um, opportunity for the village to buy zone A as a field, as a community space. And that's unfortunate that that didn't happen uh, but I think it's necessary as a trade-off to have some housing uh, to allow the development to take place. Right. Um, Councillor Howe also spoke very persuasively about matters, but the, as I mentioned, the car parking, he mentioned the car parking and the surplus, but I explained that that's always seemed to be necessary uh, so that we didn't impinge upon the residential areas. So, I, it's a bit like the Brexit vote, isn't it? It's 51-49. Um, it's very, there are advantages and disadvantages, but um, I think in conclusion, I would uh, support the approval of the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Woodward. Um, could I go to um, the proposer and seconder, Councillor Skinner and Key? Um, would I be correct in presuming that you were proposing um, for the application, for the outline and for the list of building consent? I think uh, as far as uh, I was concerned, Madam Chairman, I was proposing as it's set out in the, uh, in the recommendations, but what I the caveat that I put in as the debate was going to go forward, was giving Councillor Howe the opportunity yeah. that if he knew that was going to go forward, that he'd bring them some things in. I didn't particularly want to get into the debate too harshly around Zone A and Zone D. Councillor Howe made a suggestion talking about whether or not through negotiation that instead of three tiers, it down to two, that sort of thing I would be supportive of. Yeah. But until I get there, I, I'm not really sure um, until we've had the full debate exactly what the recommendations are going to come forward. But we can have a discussion then, Madam no, Chairman. But, but but I, they, there, were two, there are two applications. One is for the outline, the details yes. of that. I mean, that is outline. The rest will yes. fall with the reserved matters. Yes, um, yes. But... Uh, the other one was the listed building consent. You have no problem with that, I'm understanding. No. Like, no. Thank you. No. So, no. so it is the combined. Okay, two I'm not combined. Sure what I'm not sure what Councillor Key's views are. I need to ask Councillor Key. That's my view. I'm, I'm with you on no, that. No, thank fully, you. Fully, fully supportive, Chairman. Of thank what you, Councillor Key. Said. That's helpful. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Desarum. Good, good morning. Uh, th th thank you, Chair. Uh, this scheme, as we've seen, uh, provides a mixture of what we might be described as the, the good, the bad and the ugly, uh, as clearly outlined by, by Councillor Howe. And um, I think the applicant himself said it today, that this, this scheme requires careful regeneration. Um, we've heard many positive things, uh, such as this application will provide significant employment benefits. However, we've also had the fears expressed by both residents and the ward member and touched on just now about the problems with zone A and the problems with zone D. 
um, I, as far as I heard, the residents would be happy in zone A if we had chalet, chalet bungalows. And I know this is in outline at the moment, but I think clearly if we can get to some measure of detail that the residents would be happy with, we could, as Councillor Skinner has put forward, the, the proposal to accept it, if we, we are happy with certain things. Like in zone D, it is quite clear that the existing massing of the blocks has become an eyesore and, and no one is happy with it. So. I think if we as a committee could get to get to thrash out the bits that we think are appropriate uh, using, as Councillor Skinner said, Councillor Howe's input, clearly we can move forward with this project because, as we've all heard, it's been a long, long time in the making and it will provide lots of positive things. But we need to support the residents because if they're not happy with the things in zones A and D, then that's something that we as a planning authority need to take into account based on the planning uh, restrictions that we currently face. Uh, and um, I, I note that in one of the objectors letters we received today from Garen Keeley, uh, the email, they actually said, I wonder whether Mr. Rose could answer this. Um, it says, this is considered a manipulation of planning procedures and two separate applications should have been submitted for such a vast development master plan. And I wonder if Mr. Rose could quickly um, outline whether or not that is correct procedure um, because clearly these are issues which have worried residents and, and I've discovered from my reading. So that's really all I had to say. Uh, thank you so much, Chair. Thank you. Um, I wonder if um, either Mr. Rose or Mrs. Shaw could... Um, I'm happy to come back, Councillor Rack. clarify, please. Yeah, thank yeah, you. I mean, we... we be, applicants are entitled to make hybrid applications. I, I appreciate the views of the um, the, pub, the public that it, it might have been clearer if we'd had sort of three separate applications here, uh, but they're, they're proposing the application as one uh, and procedurally they are entitled they are entitled to do that. Um, and hence the recommendation that we've got uh, to approve the outline, approve the reserve matters and the, the listed building. But in, in effect, the outline and reserve, the, sorry, the, the outline and full part of the application uh, can come forward, has come forward as a hybrid and they're, they're entitled to do that. Um, yeah. if, I, if I could, while I'm just speaking, because I, I know there's been lots of mentioned about the, the three stories on uh, zone D. I could just clarify that that, that is an outline. Um, when we, yeah. if consent was granted, we aren't you you wouldn't be uh, granting a three-story building there. They've indicatively shown uh, what they feel they could put forward on the site, um, and it would be for us or yourselves as part of any reserve matters application yeah. to make a judgment about if a three-story building came forward whether that was acceptable under a suitable design, and if it wasn't, it could be it could be refused at that at, at that stage. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Th thank you. That that's the point I was trying to make, but you put it far more eloquently than I did. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Councillor Pook. Uh, thank you very much. I think this is a very sort of a comprehensive and very interesting com um, uh, application, which has got lots of benefits. And I think we have to accept that if we're getting benefits, there's going to be some disbenefits, and if if um, the disbenefits in this concert, in this application are considered as the, the the housing on A and D, then I think we've got to sort of say, do those outweigh the benefits of having this brought back into use um, and all the all the other sporting and um, environmental sides? And I would say, on balance, it does, um, especially as it will really sort of bring into this idea of a sort of mixed use development. We're going to have residential and employment use. Um, within walking distance and plus the rest of the village next door, um, you really are going to have somewhere where a lot of people will be able to, not maybe not initially, but over the eight years, be able to actually literally walk to work. And so you're going to bring back in into use this, um, this whole site. Um, so going back to the A and D side, um, just to confirm that the 10% uh, um, affordable housing does apply to A and D. So we're talking about nine houses, nine, nine homes. And I take Councillor Howe's suggestion that, you know, if we drop to 10% to make it viable to have fewer houses for the lower lower buildings in group in position D, um, I'd be reluctant to do that because, you know, I'll always stand out for a uh, stick up for affordable housing because you know, it's always needed and, we, and it's always good to get a range of um, tenures across the site. 
So I would like, I wouldn't like to sort of trade off affordable housing for reducing the height of um, the buildings in in, level, in um, area D. When you look at that flat flat roof building, if the actual ridge, uh, the flat roof height is probably about the same as if it was a um, a two story ridged ridged height. I know you've got a it's a bigger mass. Um, the photographs for the, the mock-ups certainly don't show it to be too bad. It would be useful, I think, if the developer, when he come, if he if he presents the same one at um, for um, the, the, the detailed application, to show some cross sections through, unless of course he changes a plan altogether. But um, since it is an outline, I'm not you know I'm not going to argue too much about whether it's one two stories or three stories at this stage. I think, um, but we would like to see cross sections in the future. The highways issues, um, I'm not a highway engineer, so I don't know if highways are, are accepting it. I think it's hard for us to argue against some, something which highways, and I know they're going to, you know, with their conditions, if they're going to put those in, I think it's hard for us to argue against that. So highways, I think we accept. Um, the one that does concern me, and Councillor Howe brought it up, and from my own experience, um, uh, of developing is with Southwest Water. I think the one line entry to read it, it is about what, six, six you know, one line is cynical and disrespecting the whole system. You know, to, you know, I'd almost want there to be some sort of condition in there to say, well, okay, Southwest Water, you put a one liner in saying you, you, are, you have no objections, in which case, if there's a greater demand in the future, you will be putting in some. You you will be paying for the all the extensions and things. I think it, it's it, they should prove they should put something in there to, to show they have got the capacity. And I would like um, for any detailed application to come in to actually have some detailed response and demand that Southwest Water prove that they they can cope with that because yeah, there's nothing there's nothing worse than having a, a poor water supply or even worse, um, uh, an ina inadequate sewage there. So. Um, I think they've been very remiss on that. So on the whole, um, yeah, I agree, accept the trade-off with conditions. I'll be very interested to hear Councillor Howe's um, suggestion of conditions. Um, I, I think it is supportive, um, subject to, you know, when we see the detailed conditions come in for, or detailed application come in for A and D. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pook. Um, Councillor Whitley. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, as somebody who doesn't really, who's not really sort of aware of the site, can I just say thank you to uh, Chris Rose, not to pat people on the back, but I think that presentation made everything really, really yeah. clear. So thank you, because it is incredibly complex. Um, and not knowing the site as well as some people, this is all rather general rather than specific. Um, I do agree with most of what's been said, and everybody seems to share the same concerns, which is a comfort. Um, I do wonder if given the number of recommendations and caveats we're looking at putting in places that large, if recommended approval is the right thing, but there are many, many benefits. Um, it seems looking through the officer's report that most of the points that have come up throughout the process have been mitigated against. Um, and I think, um, you know, that's credit to the developer in, in certain, you know, at certain times. Um, and as has been said, we can't do anything about the fact that part of this is only an outline application. And, you know, it's it's unfortunate because, you know, if, if it was more detailed at this point, it might take us longer to to, to get through the application. But we, we'd have a clear idea of what we were what we were looking at. Um, if we were to ultimately recommend approval, I just think Councillor Howe's point about people coming around the corner and then going right without realising they're on a junction, that's... You know, that's a real clear thing which needs to be looked at immediately. I, it's, it is a shame that the affordable housing rate is as low as it is, but I sort of understand that. Um, and I do agree with Councillor Pook, um, who said that um, Southwest Water's attitude is a little bit peculiar. Um, it's all very well saying we have no objections to this. Um, well, tell us why you have no objections. You know, be, be clearer about that. Um, and, you know, uh, yeah, and, and put in an agreement, as Councillor Pooks suggested, that, that says, well, if you have no objections and then something goes wrong, you need to sort this um, for us. And again, you know, I think it was said earlier on that it's kind of like 49.51 for or against. Um, I'm still torn and I await the rest of the debate with uh, with interest. 
Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Councillor Davey. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I mean, uh, Mr. Rose has uh, said that the, the applicants are fully entitled to bring forward a hybrid application, and um, it is only outlined for the housing element. Um, I think we're all in agreement that the office refurbishment is absolutely welcome and and all the speakers for um, have highlighted the advantages of that. If this was in the city centre, that office refurbishment, it could be a, a speculative investment against future letting income. So I kind of slightly have a problem with the idea that in order for the developers to make a profit, that they have to have the housing. And it, it feels a little as though they've... Um, kind of uh, decided to maximize their profits by by putting in some housing as well. Um, and that really is the sticking point, isn't it? We're being asked, is this an acceptable price to pay? Um, and is that housing seriously needed in order to make this site profitable? Or is it simply boosting those profits? Uh, as one of the uh, public speakers said, they would say that anyway. And I, I well remember um, uh, a presentation by uh, one of the uh, council officers uh, where he pointed out that most businesses have two or three sets of uh, uh, loss and, and profit sheets where they uh, have one for the uh, council, one for their shareholders and probably one for the tax man. Um, so uh, although I know he's gone through this and decided that the, the profit element is acceptable, um, it, it is asking a lot of us. However, I presume uh, what is going to go in zone A and zone D, the exact number, the scale and design of those will all be dealt with at reserved matters. Um, the screening issue, I appreciate those are deciduous trees. Um, and um, so I think there could be some better screening. And the exact massing of those buildings can be dealt with at reserved matters. Um, there was a mention by the conservation officer of a five meter boundary from the brook for the extended car park and, and whether some spaces could be lost. I seem to remember that. Was that retained, Mr. Rose, or uh, was the mitigation that was proposed considered acceptable? Be grateful if you could just uh, answer that one. Um, the apartment block, I actually don't have too much trouble with because I like the idea that it would probably be used by people who, who are going to live and work on that site. They've got everything they want there. They, they apart from a shop, um, they've, they've got uh, leisure um, and, uh, and work and live space. Um, and um, that is quite a sustainable model uh, in my uh, view. Um, <clears throat> the um, traffic is just a problem everywhere and i know i've queued at that roundabout on many an occasion um and the fact is we all need to find better ways of traveling and i welcome the fact that uh, one of the conditions is for a sustainable uh, travel plan which has covered things like car share which could do an awful lot uh, to uh, help with uh, the amount of traffic um Electric cars and flooding in the car park, well, I, you wouldn't put charging points down there. And actually, most of the people, if they're using electric cars, and I don't actually think they are the, the exact answer for the future, um, certainly not on the same model as we have car ownership now, um, but you wouldn't put the charging points there. And most people actually will charge their cars at home and won't need uh, charging facilities on that site. So I don't see that actually being a problem. Um, so all in all, um, given that we can deal with a lot of this uh, at reserved matters, um, I still have a bit of a problem with the housing in zone A because I think it might well be uh, used um, as residential housing and, and add to the serious traffic problems on that roundabout. Um, more so than zone D, um, but I, I, overall, um, I, I think that um, the scheme is just about acceptable as it stands, but I, 
um, would be, uh, I shall look forward to hearing uh, Councillor Howe's um, possible conditions, because I think the more conditions we can put on this, the better. Um, and uh, I would certainly like to see improved cycle access uh, to that, but I believe that is going to come forward as part of the Clist Valley um, plan. So uh, I shall look forward to that. Thank you. Um, there's no shop on site, but I'm told there's a very good one across the road. Um, <laughs> Councillor Harry, you're next, but if you don't mind, I'll go to Councillor Gazard because I'd like you to come in at the end and mind sweep. Thank you. Councillor Gazard. Thank you, Chair. Yes, it's a, it's a very complicated uh, plan, this one, but as I think it's already been said, there are some really good things in there and there's some things that uh, aren't so good. I, I would concur with what um, Councillor Davy has just said. Um, my, my two concerns are that, um, as was said by Councillor Polk, is one is Southwest Waters um, response, which is, well, is, is terrible, I think. Um, they know that there is a real problem there and they haven't really addressed the problem. Um, and I am concerned about the um, the highways response as well, that um, they haven't seemed to have given it the attention that it, it needs in this um, this plan, because there is going to be a huge increase in the um, amount of traffic that is going <coughs> to, excuse me, that is going to use that road. Um, it is good to see that the building is uh, coming back into use. And, and I think uh, we were looking at as uh, a council wants as a um, for relocation so it's nice to see that um, so many businesses are moving back into it um, but um, I still wait to hear um, what Councillor Howe has to say with his uh, added um, recommendations. Thank you Chair. Thank you Councillor Gazard. All ah, right no more blue hands so over to you Councillor Howe. Uh, Thank you very much, everybody. At least I've got a clear steer of where the committee is thinking. Um, first off, if I could start with a general condition. Um, there are numerous sub-conditions in this application that all want the agreement of the local planning authority. Um, I would like that to include the local ward member. I'm happy for the chair to be part of that as well. Um, but. Um, uh, approval on the first set, item two, four, five, seven, eight, nine, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, um, and then going on to the second set of uh, conditions, number four, number seven, number nine, number ten. And I think the third lot's just for, out, uh, for the listed building. I'm, I have no concerns about the listed building application at all. All of those, I would like involvement, obviously, from the ward member, whoever it may be at the time. Um, and I can suggest uh, the chair, if necessary, but the ward member explicitly, as they're going to get the blame for this, whatever, shall we say. Um, I really do like uh, Councillor Pook's um, recommendation about some some serious caveat on Southwest Water. And I look to our legal land, Mr. Rose, to see if that is at all possible, because I do believe that would be absolutely critical because Southwest Water, unfortunately, know of the problem, accept the problem, but don't know what the solution is. Um, and that is unacceptable when you're putting these offices back to use and adding to that with extra housing and everything else. So we need to get that right. Um, the other condition I'm most worried about is on the first set for the outline, which is on item seven, which is as part of reserve masses application for the residential elements of the proposed the detailed design code for the whole residential element development shall be sub submitted to and agreed in writing by local planning authority. As well as adding obviously myself to that or the ward member at the time to that and the chair, I'm just wondering whether it should be more open to the public and actually be part of, we can't make it a separate application, but I wish, I hope Burrington's one way and another, and I look to Mr. Rose to see if we can in any way, can expand that out because obviously it is the design code 
that will dictate the standards of building, the height of the building, the densities of the buildings and everything else. And that is the most critical part of this, particularly within relation to Zone D, um, where an awful lot of the committee have mentioned the Manor House. The actual closest listed building to Zone D is the church, which will be more affected by Zone D than the Manor House itself, although it is in the curtilage of the Manor House, if you get my meaning. So I have real concerns about the design code going forward, and I don't want to hold the development up, but I do at the same time want to make sure we get a really high class development of housing, as I'm sure Burrington's do, because they want to develop this in a very high class way, so they keep the ethos throughout. Um, I think really that's all I can say. And obviously Mr. Rose's original recommendation to pay for payment for the doctor surgery, which, or doctor surgeries, because they're all full around us. We're part of three. Um, and I would like very much to know how that's planning to be spent on which doctor surgery, um, in what way, um, and obviously how it's going to happen. Um, so can I leave those to the proposer and the seconder, please? Thank you. Um, right. Councillors Skinner and Key, um, you have any comments <laughs> on what um, Councillor Howell said? If I, if I may go first, and obviously Councillor Key can be behind, if I may go first, uh, Chair. Um, yes, I, I, I very much heard uh, what uh, Councillor Howe had to say. I'm absolutely in full support of the uh, Chairman and the uh, Ward member being involved in the discussions as they go forward with the officers. I'm reluctant. I, I'm not quite sure how... Councillor Howe was trying in trying to bring in other members of the public into the decision making process. If that's what he was suggesting, I am not going to be in favour of that. The decision making process is within the planning committee. If the if the members of the public want to involve Councillor Howe and Chair as through the through that process with the officers in the normal ways that we do things, that's fine. But to be I'm, I'm not sure. I wonder if, Councillor Howe, could I ask you if you could be, have a bit more clarity on what you meant by that? I'm not absolutely clear. Yeah. No, I, you're right. I don't want to bring... We can't change that to further consultation no. for the decision. But I would like Burrington in particular, as part of that design code, to involve the public to get oh, the right. design code right. Oh, right. You know, Sorry. it is a decision for committee or chair or whatever it is. Yeah. But I just would like them to understand... We need to get the design absolutely best for them and the current residents. Yeah, th thank you, Councillor Howe. Chair, through you. Um, okay, that's clearer now. And, and I, okay, I'm, I'm happy with that. that that's absolutely fine. Um, on, the, on the basis of one or two things that have come forward, the, we're talking about the road linings on the road junction where Councillor Howe pointed out where people were turning right, but they were coming around the road rather quickly and all that. that, that that's a highways issue, which, which can, be, can be got over through, through the lining of the road. And I'm sure that can be, uh, that can be sorted. As far as the, the 40,000 or 39,000, whatever it was to the doctor's surgery, I think as well, uh, Chair, through you and through the ward member and the officers, that that can be bashed out there about how that works because you need more information to see how that comes in. So happy with that. Not to forget the overage payment. So there was a mention earlier within the within the um, uh, discussion that uh, putting these houses in for profit, well, there's an overage payment. So if there's too much, then the council will get some one. I'm sure they're not going to uh, do that. But what Councillor Pook suggested was, was what I did suggest to Councillor Howe that perhaps when we talked about the affordable housing being lost in place of dropping down the stories, I do actually agree a bit with Councillor Pook thinking about it on, on, on hindsight, that if you get the design right. So lots of these things can, can be sort of uh, meted out, sorted out a little bit further down the road. So unless Councillor Howe uh, has specific recommendations that are not within the recommendations that are here now, and you, through you, Chair, you would like uh, me to add that to them now at this point. If he has some, be sure. If not, Councillor Howe, from what you've said, we're just moving on with the recommendations as, as per set out. 
uh, it, it, on, on the paperwork, but giving the clarity with the chair and yourself as a ward member working through that. Is that correct? Um, I don't know. Have we got um, Mr. Rose back in the meeting yet? Yep. Ah, welcome sure. back. Do you... I haven't Can been anywhere. Comment? Just yeah, well. No, I yeah, know. They let me just. You on no, the, they couldn't contact yeah. me. Yeah, a bit of the IT problems. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah. So four things I think Councillor Howe raised there. The when we have a condition, those conditions of discharge, we we do that in consultation with the chair and the ward member. Ab absolutely fine within your gift to put that recommendation there. I don't think we need to change the wording of the condition. It's just um, an extra resolution to come out to us as officers to do that consultation at that time. Happy to do that. Southwest Water, um, I'm happy to write to them uh, uh, following this meeting to explain the discussion that's happened and the concern over the, the, the briefness of those comments and the implications from that. Um, the design coding, um, I understand where Councillor Howe's uh, coming from and hopefully the applicant has received that message that before they put any reserve matters applications in, Go out and go out and consult the community and and on the design code, and if you want to go further, we could put an informative on the, any, any approval to just to remind them to do so. Um, and then yes, so the, the 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 late request for the contribution to the surgeries, um, we can sort that out in 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 consultation with the chair and the ward member. And the final thing which I added, which Councillor Howe didn't mention, was the a couple of extra of uh, environmental health conditions that I mentioned at the start. Thank you. And I think um, having been burned over the Newton pop up for one, <laughs> the proposed surgery there, I think we we need a little more detail as to um, the requirements for that. Um, so we've had a proposer and um, we've had a seconder and I go to Mrs. Shaw now to sum up, please. Madam Chairman, as a point, of rec as a point, it, it, did Councillor Key want to speak? Is he is he happy with the recommendations? Councillor yes. Key. Yes, yes, I'm more I than thought, happy with, with yes. those because as we're looking at it as an outline, okay. then we're going to rely on the ward member, the chairman, and the planning officer to actually finalise all these agreements that we actually want, and I put my trust in those to actually get what we're looking for. Thank you. Thank you. Right, um, Mrs Shaw, can you sum up, please? Yes, Chair. Um, members, if we could take this in two votes, if we could yes. please take the hybrid application being the full and the outline application first, and then we will deal with the listed building consent secondly. Okay. So therefore, for for the uh, hybrid application, the motion is to adopt the appropriate assessment, to secure the financial contributions and public access through a section 106 agreement, and that is also subject to provision of evidence in support of a local NHS GP contribution, and the approval of that to be delegated to the chair and ward member with officers and also to uh, include an overage payment obligation. Then thirdly in this one is approval of the conditions as listed, including the environmental health conditions that um, Mr. Rose mentioned. Therefore, when your name is called, would you please indicate whether you are in support of the recommendation to approve or whether you're against the recommendation to approve or whether you are abstaining from the vote? Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, carry on. Thank you, Chair. I'll start with Councillor Brown. Support. Councillor Chamberlain. Support. Councillor Davey. Support. Councillor Desarum. In support of all the recommendations as discussed. Thank you. Councillor Gazard. Support. Councillor Howe. Due to my shop, I'll abstain. Thank you. Councillor Key. Support. Councillor McLaughlin. 
Support. Councillor Pook. Support. Councillor Pratt. Support. Councillor Skinner. Support. Thank you. Councillor Whibley. Um, abstain. Thank you. Councillor Woodward. Support. And Councillor Rag. Support the recommendation. Thank you. I can confirm that motion has been carried. Thank you. Can we now therefore go on to the listed building consent? Um, the motion before you is to approve with the conditions as listed. When members, again, when your name is called, will you indicate whether you are in support of the motion to approve, you're against the motion to approve, or whether you are abstaining from the vote? Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Brown. Support. Councillor Chamberlain. Support. Councillor Davy. Support. Councillor Desaran. In support of motion to approve. Thank you. Councillor Gazard. Support. Councillor Howe. Support. Councillor Key. Support. Councillor McLaughlin. Councillor McLaughlin. Support. Sorry, Wendy. Support. Thank you. Councillor Pook. Support. Councillor Pratt. Support. Councillor Skinner. Support. Councillor Whitley. Support. Councillor Woodward. Support. Finally, Councillor Rag. Support the recommendation. Thank you. That motion has been carried. Thank you. Thank you, members. That was quite a um, hefty session, I think. Um, we move now to... Hmm, wait a minute. Oh, I've lost it. <laughs> the next, um, next application, which is item 11, application 21399, full Seat and Jurassic, the Underfleet Seaton, page 165. Thank you. Um, and we have Steve Waite and Richard Drysdale. Are they in the meeting? I believe they are. Thank you. Um, so welcome to the meeting, Mr. Waite and Mr. Drysdale. Uh, you will have three minutes to make your presentation of representations and um, you'll be told 30 seconds before the three minutes is up. Um, so over to Mr. Rose to present his report, please. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so this is an application. Um, sorry, just checking I'm not on mute. Yeah, this is an ex application for extension to the Seaton Jurassic Visitor Centre. Uh, which is located down here on your screen. So this is the road, uh, East Devon car park, play area, playing fields, uh, the new uh, Bovis housing estate and Tesco down here. Um, so it's an extension to the Jurassic Visitor Centre. Uh, it's, it's not for extensions to the building, but to the external areas. Um, and, it, and it proposes uh, extension of the, the outside areas across 18 car parking spaces that uh, are owned by East Devon District Council and then onto this informal grass area at the back of the site. And it's because of the East Devon ownership of the, the car park in that areas that the application uh, is before members. Um, so it's an established uh, visitor centre and it's next to the Seaton tramway, so the sort of hub there of, of the visitor area for Seaton. And uh, if you can see here the plans, so we've got the car park laid out as it is at the moment and the, the outside area to the Jurassic Centre, the, the gardens, and gardens and features that you can walk around. Uh, and then we've got this uh, a grass amenity area, not really used. There's a couple of picnic benches on it uh, and this top area forms part of the playing field next to the skateboard ramp. 
Um, so the proposals are to extend this outside area across this part of the site to the bottom part of this open site and to take in 18 car parking spaces from the car park. And you could see the sort of walkway that's proposed to be foot through and then extending up this area uh, outside of a fenced area. So this is open is uh, footways and benches that lead all the way up through and into the, the park there. And within these areas, there's various benches and features to, to entertain people and children as part of that, that, that Jurassic uh, experience. And they've um, themed uh, a number of the areas. So there's pole, ponds proposed. They're making landscape features of, a, of an existing earth mound, et cetera. All quite uh, low level, low level stuff um, and screened by, um, to be screened by fencing at a height of between 1.7 and 2 meters uh, to, the, to the car park. Uh, as you can see in the elevations there. Um, so this is the car parks of the application. So this is the Jurassic Center building here. You can see Tesco in the background. And this, this fence here that's designed to look like beach huts is the existing boundary to their external area. So they want to extend that across this part of the site behind those motor homes and then up the side here. Um, so, here so onto this part of the site here. Uh, extend their external area and note here you can see the seat tramway that runs uh, adjacent to the site uh, so they extend it across into this area and then you can see the opened grassed area here that they're going to put the benches on and the path etc uh, that extends all the way up at the back of the car park uh, and then into behind where the skateboard ramp is proposed um, so just as a bit of background to this, the visitor centre itself was consented in uh, 2013 with a variation application in 2014. And I think it's relevant to note that both of those applications showed that there was likely to be a phase two uh, of the development uh, in terms of extending car the, uh, the, the outside areas onto these parts of the site. Not necessarily the same, exactly the same size, but, but in this location. So that's always been envisaged to be a phase two. In terms of um, the principle of development, there's obviously support in the local plan for tourism benefits uh, that weigh heavily in favour of, of the proposal. And these will add to that, that tourist attraction uh, in the area uh, and get people coming in, in to seat and to, to experience them. So the principle of that, that development uh, is supported. The site's in a, a flood zone, but it's not a vulnerable use. Um, it's all external landscaping areas, no, no buildings proposed. So again, it's okay from, from that perspective. Visual impacts, you'll see a, a change at the end of this car park to uh, that, that fencing going across the side uh, of the site as opposed to chain link fencing at the moment. But again, no harmful visual impact from the proposal. You'll see though that there's concerns expressed by third parties and the tramway in particular about uh, car parking levels. So the proposal will result in the loss of 18 existing car parking spaces to, the, um, to, to that East Devon car park. Um, and at the time that the Jurassic Centre was uh, consented, there was uh, concerns at the, or, or issues at the time because that itself was proposed on car parking. And as a result of that, the, count, the council constructed this 69 space overflow car park on the other side of the road. So that was when the Jurassic Centre was built to compensate for the loss of the spaces on this site. So given that that overflow car park has been provided in the phase two was envisaged as part of the original applications, um, the loss of those 18 spaces now is considered to be acceptable and already uh, mitigated against. Um, you'll see in the report, though, that the, the, the concerns from the tramway about the loss of a further 18 spaces are, are appreciated and understood. And East Devon as a whole, so as, as the, as the uh, um, operators of the car parks are not with their planning hat on, uh, have advised that they will be monitoring the car parking situation in Seaton on this car park and the overflow. And that as they monitor that in time, if it becomes gets to the point where those um, car parks are full, then they will look at that time about it, uh, providing um, those 18 additional spaces elsewhere. Uh, so the council have made that commitment to look at and monitor that uh, going forward should those extra spaces be needed. With regards to residential amenity, there's no, no real concern. The closest houses are these uh, houses here that you can see that are quite a distance from on the opposite side of the tramway from this use and it's only external seating areas in daytime use. So there wouldn't be uh, impact on residential amenity. 
You'll also see that there's been concerns expressed from the tramway about visibility across this corner. So the, cor the tramway runs up and around here and is only single track at this point. There is a visibility, there's a corner here being kept away from the development uh, to enable a second track to potentially put in the, f in, in, in the future. But the tramway have concern raised concerns about visibility around this corner because there's a again 1.2 uh, 1.7 or two meter high fence proposed uh, around this boundary uh, but on that point uh, it's hard for us to do anything about that firstly because we can't you know you don't have a right to look across somebody else's land we can't protect that and secondly the Jurassic Centre could put up a two meter high fence along this boundary without requiring planning permission um, so whilst I appreciate that the tramway would probably prefer to have sight around this corner in my experience, the speed of the, the, the trams are going and the, the two-story nature mainly, I think that won't cause too much of a problem. Uh, but in any case, the applicant has said that when they are dealing with this part of the site in the fencing, they will work with the tramway to ensure that um, they can carry it out uh, as they want as much as possible. So in summary, there's tourism benefits from this proposal. There's no visual harm, no harm to amenity. There are lots of car parking spaces, but that's already been mitigated against from this overflow car park. And the council as a whole have said that they will look at uh, whether additional compensatory spaces are needed going forward. Um, and the applicant has said that they will work with the, um, with the tramway regarding uh, fencing height at this corner uh, and other issues that are raised outside of this application, for example, with regard to signage. So uh, due to those benefits and lack of harm, the application is recommended for approval. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Steve Waite, um, and welcome to the meeting. Uh, I invite you to speak. I think you're speaking on behalf of Jenny Nunn. I am indeed, yes. Thank you. Right, you'd like to start? Okay, thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. My name is Steve Waite. I'm the commercial manager here at Seaton Tramway. And yes, I'll be speaking on behalf of our CEO, Jenny Nunn. I appreciate what you just said, Chris, but I just want to go over the points I've got here. Uh, as proud partners of Seaton Jurassic and indeed Seaton Wetlands, we would really like to support this application and we're definitely not against any improvements to the local area. However, it is disappointing to see a couple of points within it which we think are unfavourable for Seaton Tramway and indeed the town. Having already lost a third of the parking spaces at the Underfleet car park when Seaton Jurassic was built in 2013, the loss of a further 18 spaces uh, we think it's unacceptable and ultimately damaging to the town's economy. Car transport does remain the number one form of travel for all visitors to Seaton, and we should be doing all we can to encourage tourism in the town and not restrict it. We ask that these lost 18 spaces are relocated with the possibility of adding electric car charging points to promote greener travel. Mm -hmm. We do have to wonder if the loss of spaces would be as acceptable if this application had come from Seaton Tramway. Although it would be welcome to see the wasteland to the southeast of the car park landscaped, we are disappointed with the style of fencing chosen to border the tram line and the car park. The sight of our heritage trams travelling up and down the line in full view of this part of town have been a highlight for the visitors here since 1975. You only need to see the number of town, number of people who smile and wave as our trams pass by to appreciate this. We want to ensure our unique style of travel remains visible for all, and this is accommodated through a change in fence design if possible. Finally, we also request further signage is included, as this construction will indeed reduce the visibility of Seaton Tramway. And improved signage we think will be advantageous to all parties, as I know we frequently get people coming in asking for Seaton Jurassic, Seaton Jurassic frequently get people coming in asking where do they catch the tram from, and occasionally this has happened once they've even paid the entrance fee and walked around most of the attraction. Uh, so improved signage, we think, will be beneficial for all. As I said, this is a project Seaton Tramway do really want to get behind. Uh, we think it's great to see local, local input, but we simply cannot offer our support until these mitigations have been resolved. Our partnership with Seaton Jurassic has flourished in recent years. We offer joint discounts. 30 seconds events, remaining. Many events successfully undertaken, and we have several more in the pipeline. We sincerely hope our comments are addressed in full to ensure the continuation of this exciting working relationship. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Wade. Um, <clears throat> we have now the applicant, uh, Richard Drysdale. 
Um, is Richard Dry? Yeah, you see um, yeah, thank you. Yes. Uh, welcome to the meeting. You have three minutes, Mr. Drysdale. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, members of the Planning Committee. My name is Richard Drysdale. I'm head of visitor centres for Devon Wildlife Trust with overall management and responsibility for Seaton Jurassic, which is our flagship visitor centre. As Mr. Rose pointed out, the planning application, as outlined here for you today, is reduced in size from the original application that was, that was approved in January 2015. This application, though, does address the elements of the size of the outside space that was not originally delivered uh, back in 2015 due to the pressures at that time on the funding and the need to complete the building. Having opened in March 2016, we have now had five years of operation. We recognise that Seaton Jurassic would significantly benefit from an enlarged outside space that firstly allows it to be properly recognised as an all-weather attraction, and secondly, the centre and in particular the education team can engage with all groups and and all groups both formal and and informal learning. The increased external space of the centre will be complemented by the addition of a designated area as outlined running between the tram line and the car park and alongside the skate park that will allow for people to appropriate interpretation to appreciate what makes Seaton so special from a geological and natural environmental perspective. The increase of the external space and the improved area will make the link between three of the key attractions for the town even greater. The Seaton Tramway, Seaton Wetlands and Seaton Jurassic will be able to market a more comprehensive offer, a better educational remit and also ensure that visitors dwell time in Seaton is increased. As Seaton looks to achieve coach friendly status, this application allows for groups to allocate more time in Seaton and for people to recognise the link between those three attractions as mentioned. Promoting Seaton as a destination that you can stay for longer, will encourage greater use of foot, cycle and tram, will help in East Devon District Councils and Devon Wildlife Trust's commitment to be carbon neutral by 2030 and their declaration to the Devon Climate Emergency. And in tandem with the tramway's new halt in the wetlands, the regeneration plans that were set out for Seaton at the turn of the millennium will be closer to fruition. We'd like to thank the committee for their consideration today and look forward to working with all of our partners and particularly Steve at Seaton Tramway to deliver an enhanced experience for locals and visitors alike. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Drysdale. We go to the ward member now, Councillor Jack Rowland. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, as you mentioned, I am a, a, a ward member within Seaton and um, I'm pleased to uh, be able to speak in favour of the application. As has been mentioned, the original planning application for the Jurassic Centre did include the area in question now, but because of not having the full funds available at the time, it was never included in the final works. The Jurassic Centre needs to keep evolving and changing what it offers, especially educationally, in order to attract more visitors to the area and also attract previous visitors back. This is also part of the uh, jigsaw involving the improved pedestrian access to the wetlands area, which in itself is a tremendous success story. And as has already been mentioned, working in conjunction with Suit and Tramway with the tremendous work that they've done with the new terminus and the Jurassic Centre and the wetlands, it's really an exciting development to bring more tourists back, which adds to the economic uh, vitality of this area, which, uh, as you know, is very much needed in regeneration terms. The specific subjects of the loss of the 18 car park spaces was discussed at an EDC uh, cabinet meeting on the 28th of October because of the impact on uh, the loss of revenue because of the loss of those car park spaces. As I'm also a cabinet, men, a cabinet member, I did put forward an additional recommendation at that meeting and I'll just read that out so members are clear about what was actually agreed uh, at that meeting. And it was that the overflow car park in the underfleet to be open all year round on the same opening and closing times as the main underfleet car park. That the income from both car parks is monitored over the course of the period post the actual loss of the, of the 18 spaces 
and to report back on the actual income received to evaluate whether additional car park spaces will be needed to be provided to replace the lost spaces. There was um, a thought that the, I think members can still see the map on, on screen at the moment, and there was an idea that the grassed area outside of the fencing alongside the existing car park could be used as a grass creek area to provide those additional spaces. Um, I'm not in favour of that at the moment, mainly because that's envisaged as a pedestrian walkway through uh, to the uh, wetlands area, if we can get other issues revolved in that particular area concerning Sheep's Marsh. So, but as I said, I did put that uh, health warning back in at the cabinet meeting, uh, but that it will be monitored, uh, but the, the overflow car park could be open uh, all year round rather than on its uh, uh, period that it is closed at the moment. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Rowland. Right, um, next we have committee, uh, Councillor Desarum. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, having heard the debate, I would like, if there's someone out there, to propose approval. Um, and when I prove approval, I'd like to add in the improved signage, as Steve Waite said. And I'd like also to be noted that we take note, as the ward member said, of the Cabinet recommendation. I'm, I'm approving it basically on the basis that, or if the members would approve it, on the basis that there is no, no visual harm and there are tourism benefits. And as the ward member said, it will strengthen the economic vitality of the area. So those are my three reasons. And obviously I'd be happy if I do find a seconder to, to accept this uh, proposal. Thank you, Councillor Desarum. Is there a seconder for the proposal, please? Yes. yes. Oh. No. Who's seconding? Yeah, I, Tony Woodward. So, thank you, Councillor Woodward. Uh, right, it's been proposed and seconded. Um, Councillor Skinner. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Madam. Oh, sorry. So, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I'm just going to go along with, with what is. I think, what, could, I, could I just declare an interest? I just, it's just dawned on me. When I was first the portfolio holder for economy, I was part of the leading the regeneration for Seton. So I was part of, of, of that and the, and the, um, the um, uh, centre there was, was part of what I was under. So I just make that uh, declaration. Um, very supportive of Seton, very supportive of Seton and, and the way it's, uh, it's portraying itself. Um, I agree with what uh, Councillor um, Bruce Desarum just suggested, I think the points that have been made, the partnership and harmony between us as an authority and the local businesses and the things that we're doing are absolutely key. And Councillor Jack Rowland pointed those things out. I think he spoke very well regards Seton and, and pushing uh, Seton forward in that way. It's very important that Seton does and is successful at what it's doing in, in the way of the uh, interpretation centre and, and the like, sir. So I'm very supportive of it. I shall be getting right behind it, Madam Chair. I'll leave it to that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, it's a question for Mr um, Drysdale, really. I think it's a, um, a great opportunity to, to expand and to make this area more fun for families and children. But I just, and I'm, this probably isn't a planning matter uh, per se, um, due to the fact you're allowed to put um, fencing up um, as long as it's below, I think it's of uh, two meters. But anyway, just wondering why the decision really to, to put fencing there, because from all accounts that um, this is sort of a natural environment or, or the wetlands it all goes together very naturally, very, very beautifully. Um, but that type of fencing, that lap fencing just looks so sterile and it's so high that when you've got children playing in this lovely area that you're creating, they, they can't see over that fencing. I can't see over it. I'm short too, but little children certainly won't be able to see the tram coming past, maybe get a glimpse of the top, but it just, I just wonder what, what the thinking behind that was and if there would be any chance of, of um, sorting that out and maybe putting something more green or, or, or something more consistent with what you're trying to achieve. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I think we'll refer back to Mr. Rose for that one. Mr. Rose, could you enlighten Councillor McLaughlin? 
Yeah, I can't I can't answer for the applicant. Um they've they've put fence in or proposed fence into this part of the site, um, which mirrors the fencing that goes around the current site at the moment. Um, so uh, I think they're, they're, they're appropriate in doing that. And obviously you have to pay to get into this facility. So they want some sort of fencing that's that, that's quite secure from from that point of view. Um, I, I can't answer the question why they've okay. chosen this type of fencing other than it matches what's already there. OK, then um, I'll do something unusual and go back to Mr. Drysdale to see if he can uh, give clarification on that, please. Yeah, Mr. Thanks, Drysdale. Thanks. Yeah, thank, thank you, Chair. Yeah, and thank you for the opportunity to clarify that. So, so the the fencing fence line that's actually then running alongside the tram line. Obviously, that chain link fence is there, um, and where possible, we will add. Uh, be working with with like the Seat and Environmental Action Group to actually be adding trees and hedges. So, to actually, you're absolutely right, Councillor McLaughlin, to actually add to that natural environment, and it's very important for us as Devon Wildlife Trust. The actual fence line on the external boundary as a security line again we recognize that if we are entertaining educational groups um so or people coming with their families that we need to have a secure barrier uh, all i can offer at this point is i will work with with the tramway and with others town council etc to ensure that fencing is appropriate um and also that the materials absolutely are you know going to be uh, of uh, you know, re recycled and will be will be as environmentally friendly as possible. So, having just uh, re regained our certification for ISO fourteen thousand and one, Devon Wildlife Trust is very committed um, to being as environmentally responsible as possible. Well, thank you, Mr. Drysdale. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Drysdale. Uh, Councillor Davy. Thank you, Chair. Uh, firstly, I ought to declare an interest because I am a Devon Wildlife Trust member and I didn't realise that was run by Devon Wildlife Trust. Um, I very much welcome this development. Um, I, I think it would be a shame if the views of the tramway are lost and I wonder if there's some way of keeping the security aspects of that because I appreciate what you're saying about school groups and so on. Security is absolutely essential there. Um, but I wonder if there's some way of providing uh, an element of visibility anyway, so that people can catch glimpses of the trams going past. I'm, I have to confess, it always brings out the kid in me seeing the tram going past there and I find myself waving whether I want to or not. Um, so um, uh, I, I think it's a very exciting development, but I think it's just a shame uh, that just a fairly minor aspect, which I think could be addressed um uh, is uh, upset the uh, the tram operators and i wonder if there's some way uh that uh, they can make an arrangement to uh, ensure i don't think that's necessarily a planning matter i hope that they can um sort that out between themselves thank you councillor Whibley. thank you chair yeah i think um councillor Rowland spoke um really really well and gave a perfectly good solution with regards to the car parking um i realized that there is sort of an ongoing relationship between the, the two parties in this and to a certain extent i you know there's there's nothing really under planning that suggests we shouldn't um accept this um and i think perhaps they just need to um work out the finer details of this between them um so i, I will be supporting um approval Thank you. Um, Councillor Hayward. Councillor? I'm not, but you, you, I, I had my hand up and you went from Councillor Rowland into committee. So, but Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you're, that. You're on a list of speakers. Didn't see that. You've only just appeared. <laughs> yeah, but all, okay. All uh, yeah, carry you. on. Thank you, Chair. It's really, Councillor Rowland has summed up everything I was going to say from uh, an, in, uh, an, an economy point of view. It's to be applauded because it will add to the, the tourism offer of Seaton. It will bring tourists in. It will bring economic vibrancy to Seaton. So really, Councillor Rowland did my job for me. Thank you very much, Councillor Rowland. I've got nothing more to add. Thank you, Chair, for your indulgence. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Councillor Pook. 
Uh, thank you. Sorry about fences again. I'm just a bit confused. The only fencing we're talking about is around the car park and the bottom end. So people standing in the car park will still be able to look east across the remaining grass and see the trams coming through. Um, so I, I think, you know, that there's a reasonable view to the trams there. Um, the, the, the fence around the sort of the northern edge, I quite accept. I'd have said that, you know, working with the applicant to have a low down fence, because I think, you know, people, visitors, the, the centre would like to be able to see the trams as they come around the bends. So again, it's a, it's, um, I'm quite, otherwise I'm quite happy to support it and suggest the applicant and the tramway get to get, get together rather than sort of, and then unless there's anything we can do in planning. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Skinner. So I, I think I, I'm clear now. Is Councillor Hayward uh, just speaking on on a planning committee member, which he's not a committee member? But if he if he was trying to get in before the members as the economy portfolio holder, that's fine. I think he he relatively explained that. That's fine. Okay, let it. Thank go. you. Okay. Um, so Shirley, would you like to sum up, please? Oh, sorry, Mr. Shaw. Sorry. Oh, Thank you, Chair. Yes, members, you have in before you just one motion, which is to approve subject to the conditions as listed in the application. Please, when your name is called, would you indicate whether you are in support of the motion to approve, you're against the motion to approve, or you are abstaining from the vote? Thank you. Thank you. I'll start with Colin Brown, Councillor Brown. Approve. Councillor Chamberlain. Approve. Councillor Davy. Approve. Councillor Desarum. Support motion to approve, subject to the condi conditions listed. Thank you. Councillor Gazard. Support. Councillor Howe. Support. Councillor Key. Support. Councillor McLaughlin. Support. Councillor Pook. Support. Councillor Pratt. Support. Councillor Skinner. Support. Councillor Whitley. Support. Councillor Woodward. Support. And Councillor Rag. Support the recommendations. Thank you. I can confirm that motion has been carried. Thank you. Um, right. Now, we said we'd have a break at one o'clock. We're not far off one o'clock. So um, could we take a 30 minute break? Come back here about 20 past one, please. OK, thank you. Thank you. Could I just thank you, Councillor Woodward? Councillor Woodward, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yep. Yes, 